session and then all of the money we raise from those donations from those tutoring sessions go straight to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And what's great about um, MSK right now is that they're not only uh, taking in donations to support cancer research, but they're originally doing, uh, they're initially doing further COVID-19 research. So mm -hmm. it's about the care and keeping of cancer patients who may have also COVID and then additionally the research of the disease on top of that. Additionally, we're also selling greeting cards and homemade friendship bracelets. A lot of people have been ordering them for Mother's and Father's Day, and as well as um, college admissions, which is really sweet. And over these two different fundraising things, we've raised about $400 for MSK, which is really awesome. We didn't think we we're gonna make that much, so we're gonna continue to do that and hope we can raise as much as we can for Memorial Sloan Kettering. Our senior experience starts on the 22nd, and that is essentially our replacement to internships. So we worked pretty hard with the administration team to come up with another option. And what we decided was this would be a project that you could do, and it would really be a time for all students to get academic credit. And um, I mean, so long as they're in good academic standing, that to pursue one of their side interests and make a project on it. So we all had to write up proposals and they're all in. Uh, administration has looked over all of them, I believe, since I don't know of anyone that got declined. And I personally am trying to start this small college uh, program thing, but it's it's lots of things and things and that because I'm not quite sure exactly yet. But um, I know a lot of kids are like trying to make a investment portfolio and stuff like that. So it's a nice opportunity for kids to learn some different things. And that means that Thursday is our last official day as seniors, which is absolutely terrifying and will definitely be interesting to be able to say goodbye to like all these teachers and wonderful classmates virtually but i'm sure it'll be fun yeah we're it's a bittersweet ending for sure especially during these times um we wanted to give a quick shout out and thank you to our guidance department uh they recently sent out a survey to um I'm not sure if it was the seniors or the entire grade, but I know that there was one specifically for the seniors. Oh, there was one for everyone. And then um, there was one specifically to the seniors asking, um, you know, how we were doing during um, this, you know, un under these circumstances, how our college admissions have been affected by this um, and how we're just overall feeling, which was really nice to know that even if, you know, Obviously, the guidance department is kind of the last thing on my right, mind right now. I'm more focused on graduation and college and everything that's going on right now. But it was really nice to see that the guidance department, amongst all this chaos, is really still thinking about us. And so the survey was a really, really nice um, thing to receive. Additionally, um, I know that a lot of my friends are receiving really helpful guidance from the guidance department as well as Ms. Randy Green on college acceptances, especially since students can't visit colleges now. Um, Ms. Green is providing a lot of great opportunities for virtual visits and as much information that she can provide as possible on those different colleges. So that's um, really awesome. Additionally, the juniors are now beginning their college admissions and applications process, which evidently I, my sister's a junior, so she is really stressed about this all, especially given the circumstances. Um, but I know that she recently met with Ms. Green and um, the guidance department and the college counseling department is really, you know, stretching their time across all students and making sure that um, we're all, all of our needs are being met, whether it be with college admissions, just saying hi, whatever it may be. I recently called my guidance counselor, Ms. Luxburg, the other day just to say hi and check in and see how she's doing and she wanted to see how I was doing. And it wasn't because I had a specific issue, but it was just really, really nice to check in with her. And she gave me some advice on different projects. And we just wanted to sincerely thank you, the guy, give a thank you to the guidance department for working tirelessly to make sure that our mental health needs are met as well as our school and physical needs. So I believe that I'm not supposed to say too much about graduation because I think that you guys are going to hear about that from someone other than me um, in a few moments. So I'm just, I, we, I, I guess I'll just give some background. We worked um, with administrators and like the senior student government and a lot of individual seniors themselves because everyone seemed to have something to say about the graduation issue. 
um, or rather not issue anymore. But so we have come up with an original plan that looks like a motor procession on that will be on the actual June 12th or day of June 12th. And then students would get uh, diplomas in the mail and student speakers which would still speak, which is interesting and awesome. Um, and we will also be able to wear caps and gowns as we'll get them through a drive-through process on the 9th and 10th of June. And we are trying to plan something for the seniors in the future that would be whenever um, it's possible, obviously, whenever we could be in outdoor gatherings and we could be far apart as well. I'm not an expert on that, but um, we were thinking like we could do a, hopefully whenever the world opens up again, we could do a graduation in at La Chatte Farm or the Field Club or something like that. And that seems to have a lot of um, positive reactions coming at it. Um, and then just to close, we wanted to thank, you know, all of our teachers, the administration, uh, the board and the PTO for everything they've done for us. I know we speak on behalf of the entire student body, especially the seniors um, with our sincerest thank yous because we understand and we're obviously disappointed that, you know, our end to Weston High School is not what we had hoped it would be, but we also understand that administration has been working tirelessly to make sure that our experience is as good as it can be considering the circumstances. So we just wanted to thank everyone uh, briefly and also give a shout out to our teachers who have been working tirelessly during AP week. Uh, this isn't just an adjustment for us, it's also an adjustment for them. You know, their entire teaching method and curriculum has been flipped on its head. So we really, really appreciate all the work that our teachers have been doing with providing us with supplemental practices, with giving us new information, how the AP tests are running, giving us practice tests over practice tests over and over again. So we just truly are so thankful that we have a community in a district that supports us uh, like Weston does. And we are so, so grateful that given the circumstances, our end of Weston High School experience is as positive as it could be. So thank you. Thank you. Chelsea Graham, um, first of all, congratulations. Um, you. You're in the home stretch now since Thursday is your last day and I wish you nothing but um, the most success next year. Um, I have a quick question though, Chelsea. I really loved hearing about the tutoring against cancer and it benefiting slowed Kettering. Can you tell me how you're advertising for that so that that communication gets to all four schools? So we've mainly been posting in the different uh, Facebook groups of different moms and dads around Weston. Um, and then we've sent a good amount of emails out to um, certain people on the PTO and other things, but we can't really send it out. I mean, at least the students can't. Um, can't really send it out to the parents because we obviously don't have those emails. So we're trying to look at different ways to publicize beyond just the Facebook. Okay, great, thank you. Well, thanks again, uh, Graham and Chelsea for all you've done, all you continue to do and all you're going to do in the future. Um, and uh, again, good luck to both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so uh, I guess at this point, Meredith, do we have public comment to read? I do. We have one comment from Greg and Jen Haythorn, 6 Winthrop Hill. Thank you board members and senior administrators for your vigilant work during this ongoing emergency. Our kids are participating virtually in school activities essential to the high school experience, such as student government elections, counseling and team sports activities. Even though there are no competitions, virtual participation in distance learning still fosters the team and school spirit so vital to the restarting of the campus. Hats off to the creative efforts and diligent, diligent problem solving to make these experiences a fulfilling reality under these circumstances. As public comment tonight, we will note the change in this evening's meeting agenda to drop the public discussion of superintendent performance review, 
which we note is now scheduled for closed door BOE executive session tomorrow morning. We also not note that there are no backup documents offered with this executive session agenda item, which would be useful to the public for input were the BOE in a position to share some of its preliminary work on this long overdue matter. We note the investigative journalism work of the Hartford Current over three years ago now, which submitted FOIA requests to every public Connecticut district for a copy of the public annual district superintendent review. The link to the article is here for the board's reference dated December 29th, 2016. A participant in our Western Connecticut budget dilemma forum attempted to reach the article's journalist, but was informed that she had just this past week left her post indefinitely on maternity leave. Timing is everything. So we'll summarize the useful bits for the board in the absence of hoped for details directly from the source. While the Western District and BOE appears to technically be in compliance with the state law regarding transparency on a secret superintendent performance review. West is, Western is in the small majority of Connecticut districts, 30%, keeping its oral only performance reviews shielded from Western voters and parents. This despite that Western superintendent earns more than Connecticut's governor on most, most large Connecticut Metro district superintendents and on a per pupil basis, probably more than any other comparably sized K through 12 public district in the nation. In fact, years ago, the state of Connecticut's Freedom of Information Commission stated that Weston's practice of concealing BOE evaluation of superintendent performance has no place in representative democracy. We can do better for every Weston student when the highest when the highest paid suburban superintendent in the nation sets the example for performance accountability for every district staff member. We respectfully suggest to the Weston BOE that, it's, that it is time to walk the talk on voter and parent transparency, adopt district operating standards, publish them and specific measurable superintendent performance goals and report them annually to Weston voters. Please begin with tomorrow's executive session. Lastly, lastly, we note that despite a Board of Finance budget vote three days from now delayed uh, specifically to permit time for the annual for the district administrators and Board of Education leadership to compile a more thorough and transparent elimination uh, estimation of total COVID closure district savings that tonight's meeting agenda does not specifically include an update on savings calculations. Perhaps it will be included in the monthly financial update. If not, please add to the meeting discussion ad hoc. Thank you very much and stay safe. Is that all of them, Meredith? That is. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, let's move to new business now, uh, retirements. Uh, you have before you as a board two retirements. They require separate motions, but I'll just read. You have the retirement of Dr. John Kingston after many, many years of service to the district. Uh, you also then have the retirement of Lorraine DiNapoli, who just joined the district, uh, but is retiring. Uh, in both cases, these are personal decisions, uh, highly respectful decisions, and we'll miss both employees. Uh, can I have separate motion? motions. Move that the Western Board of Education recognize the retirement of Dr. John Kingston, effective June 30th, 2020. Second. Second, Ruby. All in favor? Aye, Melissa. Aye, Ruby. Aye, Taffy. Aye, Aye Victor. Aye, Gina. Aye, Hillary. Aye, Tony. All opposed? Uh, motion passes. Can I have the second motion? Move that the Western Board of Education recognize the retirement of Lorraine DiNapoli, effective June 30th, 2020. Second. Second, Ruby. Thank you, Ruby. All in favor? Aye, Melissa. Aye, Ruby. Aye, Gina. Aye, Taffy. Aye, Hillary. Aye, Victor. Aye, Tony. All opposed? Motion passes. Uh, resignations? 
Uh, you have before you seven separate resignations. Um, again, each of them has their own motion. I'll read the names. I do know that Mike Rizzo would like to make a few comments, but I'll call on him after I've listed all the names here. You have the re resignation of Michael Rizzo, Assistant Superintendent of Pupil Personnel Services, uh, the resignation of Maria Quarquel, Weston High School Spanish teacher, uh, the resignation of, of Kirsten Carlin, Weston Middle School music teacher, resignation of Ben Megna, Weston Intermediate School special ed teacher, resignation of Stacy Reisner, physical education teacher, resignation of Mackenzie Robins, Weston High School tech and engineering project lead the way teacher, and the resignation of Gary Webster, art technology district wide. And I do know before you speak to the, the motions that Mike did want to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, if I may, um, I just wanted to express my gratitude uh, for uh, a number of things uh, that I've experienced here in Weston, beginning with uh, the, uh, the ability this gave me to work with a tremendous parent community. It's been a pleasure to, uh, to get to know the parents in this community and work with them on behalf of their children. Uh, I'm very grateful for the teaching staff and all of the staff uh, that I've been able to work with. They're a tremendously dedicated group, uh, creative, student-centered, um, really excellent educators, and it's been a pleasure uh, to work with all of them. Uh, my administrative colleagues, uh, truly an exceptional group, our building-based administrators, our central office administrators, um, extremely dedicated, creative, personalized approach to learning in Weston, and it's um, it's been a, it's been um, a, bl a blessing for me to have been able to work with these people so closely. Uh, I'd like to, in particular, thank uh, Dr. McCursey. Uh, Bill has been a uh, tremendous leader uh, in my time here in Weston. Um, I am very grateful for his leadership, for the coaching that he's provided me, for the mentorship that he's provided me. Uh, and I do, um, you know, I'm I'm leaving here a a better administrator as a result of those experiences. Um, and then finally, uh, to the board, I'm, I'm very grateful for all of you and for the support that you've provided for special education programming uh, during my time in Weston. Uh, it was not an easy decision for me uh, to make, um, and, and ultimately, um, it is a decision that I made. So, I'm, I'm, again, I'm very grateful. It's been a tremendous experience, and um, I wish all of you uh, the well and uh, very well, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Um, Mike, we... Uh we all hate to see you go. Um, the the um, what you put in place here, uh, both both professionally and and also yourself as a as a person, um, uh, will will stay with us. Will stay with this district for for a long time to come. Um, and uh, you're you're really going to be missed. And and I think I speak for the entire board when I say that. Um, you have always been professional, um, even even in the most challenging times. Um, and uh, I just wish you and your family the all the best in the, for for the future. You have a very bright future ahead of you. Um, and uh, I thank you for all of you all that you've done for Weston. Thank you so much, Tony. I appreciate that. Um, can. Uh, before we go on, can I have a motion? Move that the Weston Board of Education recognize the resignation of Michael Rizzo, effective June 30th, 2020. Uh, second. Second, Ruby. Um, any discussion? I just want to pile on the thanks, Mike. I, I remember when we established the interview committee for your position, you are a shining star from the very first time you came in front of the board. And it has been a pleasure learning um, the ins and outs of special education. And it's been a pleasure getting you to know you as a person and just wish you all the best um, in your next career. Thank you, Thank you Gina. Uh, sadly, all in favor? Aye, Melissa. Hi, Ruby. Hi, Gina. Oh, all right. Hi, Taffy. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Victor. Uh, Hi, Tony. <laughs> Hi, Hillary. We all reluctantly are saying I. Yes. Um, all opposed. Uh, all in favor. Uh, motion passes.
<laughs> okay, Bill, uh, you want to move on with the others? Uh, well, I think you can just move right through them. You've got, um, you, you, you might be able to read them all as motions and vote as a full group. I think that's allowable. But now that you started down one by one, I think you need to continue that way. Do I, do we really need to do that? Okay. Well, okay. I, 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 just in fairness to everyone else listed here, I think now that you okay. start. Okay. Uh, why don't we do that then? Uh, let's have the motions. Move that the Western Board of Education recognize the resignation of Maria Caracal, effective June 30th, 2020. Second. Second, Ruby. Thank you. All in favor? Aye, Melissa. Aye, Chaffee. Aye, Ruby. Aye, Gina. Aye, Victor. Aye, Hillary. Aye, Tony. Uh, all opposed? Motion passes. Okay, next motion. Move that the Western Board of Education recognize the resignation of Kirsten Carlin, effective June 30th, 2020. Second, Ruby. All in favor? Aye, Taffy. Aye, Melissa. Aye, Ruby. Aye, Gina. Aye, Victor. Aye, Hillary. Aye, Tony. All opposed? Uh, motion passes. Next motion. Move that the Western Board of Education recognize the resignation of Ben Magna, effective June 30th, 2020. Second, Ruby. Second. All in favor? Aye, Taffy. Aye, Melissa. Aye, Ruby. Aye, Gina. Aye, Victor. Aye, Hillary. Aye, Tony. All opposed? Motion passes. Next motion. Move that the Western Board of Education recognize the resignation of Stacy Reisner, effective June 30th, 2020. Second. Second, Ruby. All in favor? Aye, Melissa. Aye, Taffy. Aye, Ruby. Aye, Gina. Aye, Victor. Aye, Hillary. Aye, Tony. All opposed? Motion passes. Next motion. May I do this one, please? Sure. Move that the Western Board of Education recognize the resignation of McKinsey Robins, effective June 30th, 2020. Second. Second, Second Ruby. Okay. All in favor? Aye, Taffy. Aye, Melissa. Aye, Ruby. Aye, Gina. Aye, Victor. Aye, Hillary. Aye, Tony. All opposed? Motion passes. Next motion. Move that the Western Board of Education recognize the resignation of Gary Webster, effective June 30th, 2020. Second. Second, Ruby. All in favor? Aye, Aye Melissa. Taffy. Aye, Taffy. Aye, Ruby. Aye, Gina. Aye, Victor. Aye, Hillary. Aye, Tony. All opposed? Okay, motion passes. Uh, next item on the agenda is discussion of uh, effective school solutions and contract. I'm going to pass this over to Mike Rizzo and is necessary during discussion. I can certainly share more, but Mike's on point to uh, handle this one. You ready, Mike? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity to review the ESS uh, work that we've done so far uh, this year and over the past several years, as well as the, uh, the contract for the following year. So we have with us uh, on the call tonight, Cheryl and Lisa, both of whom are administrators for the ESS program. Uh, Cheryl uh, will lead us through the presentation in a minute. Um, I just wanted to uh, say up front that uh, ESS has been a valuable partner uh, to the district in meeting the needs of students and providing um, a level of therapeutic care uh, that is higher than uh, what most public schools are able to accomplish. Uh, so that they've been very valuable in helping address those student needs, um, working not only with students, but also with families. Um, secondly, I, would, I, would, I will say that uh, this partnership uh, continues to grow. Um, Ms. Wolak and her staff, um, as well as the ESS staff, have worked very hard over 
uh, the past year uh, and probably more than that actually in really personalizing the approach for ESS to make sure it fits within Weston. Um, and ESS has been responsive to the requests uh, of the high school staff in terms of data and looking for accountability uh, that meets Weston standards. So it's been a, a very good partnership and one that continues to grow. Uh, and I um, am very proud of that um, because it's, it's as much as ESS is a program that we, we uh, provide, it's also um, they strive to meet our Weston standards and needs. So it's been very productive in that way and will continue to grow. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Cheryl and Lisa, let them lead uh, through the presentation and then we'll have a chance to address any questions that exist at the end. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, you're on mute. I'm sorry, yes, <laughs> let me try again. Uh, my name is Cheryl Clanton. I'm the uh, regional director. Um, so I supervise the staff at uh, Weston High School on a regular, you know, weekly basis. I'm there and available every day of the week as well. And uh, Lisa, I'll let you introduce yourself. Well, hi, I'm Lisa Siappi. I'm the executive director of Effective School Solutions, and I oversee all of the programs that we have uh, currently. And we'd so, like to say thank you to Mike as well before we start. It's been a, a wonderful partnership and he's been really wonderful in supporting us and kind of collaborating and um, making sure that we're able to meet the needs of the Western students. So we are going to miss you as well. So we just want to say thank you. Yes, I agree with that. It's been a very, very good partnership and collaboration with schools is really key for our programs to be successful. And Weston has definitely been very collaborative. So we appreciate that. Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen. We're going to go over the um, the PowerPoint that I think was shared with you already, but um, we're just gonna highlight certain pieces. So um, bear with us. And if you have any questions at the end, um, I'm gonna have to pull it up. Let's see. Wow. A little bit of a learning curve. We usually use Zoom, so Google's new for us. <laughs> for us. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm getting there. <laughs> okay, great. Here we are. <laughs> All right. Um, so we want to start by saying that um, uh, ESS is a intensive tier three clinical intervention. Uh, our primary uh, purpose is to address the needs of uh, students' mental health needs and challenges, and also um, assist with the financial challenge uh, by preventing out-of-district placements. Um, so the goals are, again, a higher level of therapeutic care, uh, working with those at-risk students to improve their grades, decrease discipline issues, and increase attendance. Uh, and to give the district an out of uh, an in district option to uh, instead of uh, sending them students out to therapeutic schools. Um, so we hope to just tell you a little bit about our services for those of you that aren't familiar. We're going to review. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, this is a typo. We're going to review uh, marking period two data and tell you about um, our data from our remote sessions. We're gonna talk about cost savings and uh, let you know what parents are saying. Okay, so the one that, um, we're not gonna go through all these slides because I know we're kind of pressed for time. So this is kind of good just for you guys to have um, in your packets, but um, what circles here is just, we're, we're providing tier three. Um, we try to match up our uh, mental health uh, framework into the RTI framework. So kind of marrying the mental health world and the educational world. So what we're doing basically is a tier three um, for the most intensive students that Cheryl had already mentioned. These are students that would not be able to be maintained in a public school setting typically um, because of their mental health challenges. And with them being in district, obviously Weston is a really wonderful district that offers a lot to their students. So they're still able to benefit from the education and the social component and the clubs and sports and all those pieces if, if, if maintained in the district. 
Um, this just makes what this, um, this is the 10 essential elements of ESS. Basically what this is, is all the components that come in to our program. Um, I'm not gonna go through them again, but just like I said, we are a program. I'd like to stress that out. Um, I know there are a lot of companies that do kind of a rent a therapist model where a therapist comes into the building and kind of just provides treatment. Our staff is in the building every day, all day. They follow the school schedule. They're there in the morning when, right before school starts. They're there um, through the school day and one evening a week to accommodate family, uh, schedule sessions, family schedules to do family sessions. So they're doing uh, individual group family therapy, um, there's documentation, clinical documentation we keep um, on our um, mental health record, um, which is also the school's mental health record that they have access to, and uh, quality and risk management. We're always making sure our students are safe. So uh, we have protocols and procedures for everything like school avoidance and uh, behavioral students. Uh, here's a little bit of a structure of what it looks like. Uh, again, you know, like I said, there's group therapy, family therapy. Uh, we do crisis management as well during the day. So since our, sta our, our staff are in the building during the day, every day, they're able to intervene if a student's having a crisis during the day in the moment. Um, and actually, that's really beneficial because they're able to kind of be able to give interventions right when the student's in crisis. And so delivery one is a wraparound model. That's the that's the um, what what Weston is receiving. Delivery two is more of a therapeutic school. And delivery three, we'll talk about a little bit more later. But that's actually how we've kind of modified into a virtual model. So here's our um, statistics for marking period two. Uh, we had a census of 16 students. There were um, 259 group sessions attended during um, that period, uh, 134 individual sessions. Uh, our PRN sessions are um, unscheduled uh, individual sessions. So we're working with the students in the moment if they're um, upset or dysregulated or struggling with staying in class. Um, so there were 72 of those and uh, 36 family visits and 11 home visits. Uh, we do home visits when students are struggling with getting into the building. Um, so uh, we're speaking to comparing to baseline. Baseline is the marking period prior to entry into ESS. So in marking period two, we increased the GPA for our cohort by 9%. Um, we in decreased uh, unexcused absences by 44%. And then the discipline, um, it looks crazy, 257% decrease. But um, in fact, compared to marking period one, um, and we're just looking at write-ups uh, because really there's very little um, disciplinary issues. Um, there's much, it's much more of a, you know, mental health presentation. Um, so uh, we did decrease uh, disciplinary write-ups 257% when compared to marking period one. Uh, those other, the other things on this slide we're going to talk about later. Um, so again, those um, urgent non-scheduled sessions, there were 72 during marking period two. Um, and we estimate on average, those are about a half hour. So that um, adds up to 34 um, hours of, um, if we weren't there to absorb and work with those students, it would be 34 hours of other staff time. Um, this is just giving you an overview um, from the start of the program. Uh, there were three students um, from the start, which we started four years ago, um, that were returned from out-of-district placements. And none of those uh, needed to go back out to out-of-district placements um, provided by the school. And then uh, we brought two that were on home instruction uh, back into the school with our support. Um, so from the start of the program, there were 40 students that have worked uh, with us in ESS. None of those students needed to be sent to an out-of-district placement by the school. Um, in addition, we, um, we believe that um, if we weren't there, at least 20% of the students uh, that are working with us um, wouldn't be able to be in Weston High School without our support, so they would need an out-of-district placement. So if you look at um, that as prevented out-of-district placements with the average of 100,000 per year for the cost of an out-of-district placement, 
um, placement plus, you know, transportation costs and the average um, stay in and out of district being two years, that's uh, $1.6 million saved um, or prevented um, from out of district. Um, and this uh, scorecard speaks specifically to this year. So we have two students currently that were brought back from out of district. And uh, we believe five students who uh, would be able to uh, be at school at Weston without our support, which totals $700,000 for the year. The cost of the program is um, just shorter, of, you know, it's $286,000. Um, so that's a surplus just for this year of 410,000 that we saved. So just to shift gears, oops, sorry, I have a head um, Just to shift gears, um, we wanted to look to obviously what's happening now. Am I the only one having a bad idea? Um, sorry. There's some feedback. Yeah, right. Like it's throwing me off a little bit. Okay, I think it's better now. Um, so we want to just kind of shift as to um, what obviously is happening now with COVID and how it's impacting the students, um, and you know what are some of the things that we've been able to do in collaboration with uh, Weston to continue to support the students. Uh, obviously, some of mental health is is a big concern uh, currently, obviously for our students and our families. Um, so some of the things that you know we are focusing on is. In, in terms of academic stressors, we are kind of checking in with the students on how they're doing academically um, and supporting the student, the teachers with that. So a lack of motivation, I know I have it. I just said that actually today that I have, uh, even though I'm home a lot, I feel like I'm, I'm, my motivation level has been decreasing the longer I'm sitting at home. Um, you know, obviously family and economic stressors is a big a big point. Um, some of our, fam um, our students have challenging home environments and that can kind of impact um, their anxiety and stress levels um, as well as the parents. Right, uh, social isolation. I know that students, including my kids in my own house, are feeling pretty isolated and lonely at times. So, um, you know, for someone who's already kind of isolated um, and depressed, that could definitely exacerbate some of those feelings. And then just the simple anxiety that we're all having on some level about just getting sick or someone in the family being sick. So this is what the uh, distance learning looks like currently. Um, we're doing group sessions, um, family check-ins. Uh, we're also doing individual student check-ins. Assessments are a new addition. We are able to um, take on new students on referrals and do virtual assessments. Um, we're doing meetings with, with staff members. I know for West in particular, we're doing bi-weekly admin meetings where we're collaborating on all the students that we're providing services for, making sure that we're all on the same page in terms of um, what's being provided and what's needed. Um, professional development. Um, we have weekly newsletters that are going out as well with the different webinars and trainings for um, teaching staff and even parents. Um, so this is what it looks like as a snapshot of what we've done in Weston um, as of March 16th through, through May 1st. Um, for student participation, we have 16 students enrolled in the program. 13 students have um, engaged in the virtual. Um, at this point, there are three students that have been a little bit more challenging to engage. Two of them were actually, we were about to discharge prior to all of this happening. But obviously with the impact of COVID and um, what the uh, trauma may do to a student's mental health. We were, we kind of paused on all of that and wanted to see how they would do um, during this before we discharge. So a couple of them were kind of already had one foot out the door and we're kind of done with support services at this point. Um, but we have been collaborating with the school district um, very regularly and we've been working with each other to kind of make sure the student and the families are in a good place. Um, so that's 81% of our students have been engaged um, with our services currently. Uh, as far as student therapy, we have done during that time 198 um, individual outreaches to students and um, 88 therapeutic check-in sessions have been completed. Um, family and parent therapy, so we've done 113 outreaches. These are just reaching out to the families, checking in, making sure everything is going okay. Not only making sure the students are, are okay in a mental health place, but also the families. We know that this is stressful for everyone in the household. There's been 113 of those and 67 um, therapeutic family check-in sessions during this time. Um, and then other therapeutic support, we're doing weekly therapy. 
Um, this just began in April, so it's, the number is low. Obviously, they will continue to rise. So there's been six completed. Um, there is constant collaboration with uh, school staff, 25 hours. So that's you know being involved in PPT meetings virtually or any type of school meetings um, that are occurring. Um, hours of school meetings, which is the next one, 10 and a half hours um, have been done on that so far. And collateral contacts, collateral contacts are, um, we, we are continuing to reach out to outside providers. We are still um, making higher level of care recommendations. So if a student is unable to contract for safety or is really struggling with their mental health right now and our check-ins are not enough, we are able to make recommendations currently for a higher level of services. So that's what those contacts are, is just to coordinate care. Um, and now, I mean, our biggest focus right now, which, which I know is on uh, everyone's mind in the school districts, is what is it going to look like when we come back? Um, obviously, we're pretty concerned about our students. I think, you know, there's a variety of students that are enjoying being at home, correct, right? Those students that are school avoidant, that, that in, are really not socially um, engaged. These are the students that are going to have an increase of anxiety when they return. So really trying to think about how do we best support them with transitioning back into the school. Um, we do provide ESY services and we're thinking about, you know, how do we do desensitization and bring them back to where they feel that, you know, um, coming back to school is going to be an option and uh, as less stressful as we can possibly make it for them. Um, the other concern is those students that maybe didn't have anxiety surrounding school attendance, that can be exacerbated when we go back to. So we're just making sure that we're providing services and, and being proactive instead of um, reactive when the school um, does hopefully reopen. And this um, is uh, some results from our parent survey, which we do check in with our uh, parents through a survey twice a year. So this was, um, this specific was mid-year. And you can see that most of the uh, parents and guardians are um, either strongly agree in terms of their satisfaction or agree that um, we're being helpful and they're getting their needs met with the program. Um, and then just some quotes. So we wanted to um, just share one. I'll let you read the others on your own. Um, ESS has been a positive and valuable experience for our family. Our child has experienced great emotional and behavioral growth since the beginning of high school, and ESS has been a key part of that change. In addition, the increased support provided by ESS over the past few months has helped all of us better manage the transition to distance learning. I believe ESS has provided a necessary higher level of in-school support that has allowed our child to remain safely in the Western School District. That would be it. So I don't know if, if there are questions. Well, thank you, thank you, Cheryl and, and Lisa. Um, let me uh, open up questions uh, from other board members. Hi, Cheryl, hi, Lisa, this is Ruby. Hi. First of all, um, Thank you guys and thank you, Mike, for, for this presentation um, because I knew very little about ESS before reading this PowerPoint, so thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. I know that you mentioned um, so that you've been, this, this pro we've, you've been in Weston for the past four years. We've had this program for the past four years. Are you, and I know that based on your tier model, it says that you serve from elementary to high school um, but in Weston, are, are you in the lower schools or are you just in we, middle school and high school? We are actually in the high school. So uh, that's a good question, Ruby. So uh, ESS is located in the high school and they work primarily with our high school students. Uh, since I've been here on occasion, they have worked with a couple of middle school students. We've been able to flex that support down and we've done some professional development uh, across the district uh, because ESS does offer that as well. So we've been able to use um, their services, uh, not specifically with students um, so much at those other levels, uh, uh, but uh, certainly with some of the staff. And then, as I said, they did flex down to two, um, I think it was two middle school students that we were primarily working with that uh, we were able to be flexible with how they delivered the services. Got it, okay. And then some of the increases and decreases you talk about here, are you quoting this year versus last year or are you quoting since inception? So for the past four years? Um, so the data that I shared, um, the 9% increase in GPA was comparing um, marking period two GPA to 
what we call baseline, which is the um, the marking period prior to the students entering. Got the it. Okay. And we don't. I would just add, I'm sorry. I would just add to that too. Um, some of those, uh, Lisa, uh, Julie, Matt, um, Meredith Starzik, um, they really have really done a good job working with ESS, trying to get more and more meaningful data. Mm -hmm. So ESS collects data um, as a as a group for their you know for their company. Um, what Lisa has really spearheaded is really trying to get a more critical look at that data um, and how it works for Weston students. Um, and it's been, um, I think it's been important for the team to see like what it means for our Weston students. I mean, for example, some of the discipline uh, that was being collected initially was related to uh, suspensions. Well, we don't really have that many suspensions, right? So why don't we look at a more meaningful sort of disciplinary uh, piece of data to see how, how kids are being um, you know, impacted in, in that way. So uh, it's been, a, it's been a, um, I think, a very healthy dialogue um, and something that I think shows the, shows the partnership. Yeah. Okay, sorry, the one last question then. So um, if, if the support essentially for all of ESS is outsourced, is there any training going on so that when we support given a current, a specific day or week or whatever that our on-site staff can handle those situations? I'm not sure I understand the question. Let me, I think I get it. So let me, let me, let me try. And then if um, Cheryl or Lisa want to jump in, um, there's a high degree of coordination between our staff and the ESS staff. Um, and I think actually that's something that we've um, uh, done better uh, year over year since ESS came with us, came to us. Um, so for example, when they're working with a student, if there's a student who is primarily working with ESS staff, um, that student could transition out of ESS and, and into you know, working with our social workers or counselors or school psychologists. And that's, that's a coordinated effort so that you know, we're using the same language, the same kinds of supports, those things. Great. Likewise, it can go the other way. Um, so so you know, I think um, Lisa Wolak and, and her team have done a really good job of bringing ESS into those conversations, into some of those important meetings so that we can coordinate and sort of wrap around those students. Got it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, we, just um, to elaborate a little bit, we do um, do meetings. Typically, I think they're biweekly at Wesson and a new program. Sometimes they're weekly, depending on what the staff want. And we go through every single student. We talk about how they're engaging in services, what our interventions are, and, and we collaborate together about when it's time for step down. So and we kind of make a plan together. So it's definitely a, a collaborative approach, um, even though we're taking them under our wing and doing a lot of the interventions uh, until they're stable. And then we talk about step down, but it's something that we're not doing in our own silo. We're definitely communicating regularly. Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, um, yeah, go ahead, Tony. No, um, you know, we're all learning something new during this public health crisis, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's, you know, just from the, the, the way in which you're delivering your support now, um, what are some of the things that maybe you've learned that, that could help in the future even enhance the uh, support that we're giving to our students? It, it, well, it was definitely a learning curve. We um, were thrown in it to it the same way that your teachers were. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we do, like, there are little things that um, the students, um, like, need. They need, like, a, a rallying support person. So we have staff who, uh, will log in and sometimes just stay online while the kids are doing their work. Not that they need any assistance. It's kind of an emotional support to get it done, to know that there's going to be somebody checking in with them to get their work done and to um, help them through it, um, to help them understand what the instructions are, you know, and if we can't do it, then to get the teacher online with us as well. So there's been a lot of collaboration with teachers and um, I I think that's needed, especially for the students that are um, more high risk um, and have, you know, more needs. Yeah, I, I get, well, go ahead. Now, do you find that these, uh, that that the, the, um, the virtual component of this may live on even at some point when we go back to normal? Yeah, I mean, I think um, this definitely challenged us, it pushed us. I mean, obviously, I, I'm sure most of us, when all this happened, we were like, okay, a couple weeks, we'll have to go virtual and then we'll go back to the norm and that wasn't the case. So every week we were trying to figure out how do we make the virtual model um, 
better? How do we do this the, the most ethical and most responsible way? So that's why, like in the beginning, we did individual check-ins. We didn't really do group yet until we really felt comfortable enough and did enough research as to what a group should look like virtually, because we don't we want to do our best to support our students and obviously make make them feel supported. So um, we are definitely planning for um, more continued virtual services. I'm not sure what next year is going to look like. I'm going to imagine there's going to be periodic closures. Um, so we want to be prepared to be able to support the students. And that's why assessments is something new that we've just added because in our um, mental health record, which is, uh, you know, it's online, it's a virtual record, it's an online record, uh, an electronic record. You know, now we have a patient portal, which before all this, we didn't have a patient portal. We did the assessments in person, they signed the consent, and now the parents have, you know, are able to sign on. We can email them the sense the consents earlier through the patient portal. They can sign it, and it's a lot more, um, you know, efficient that way. So we're definitely trying to make sure that we have things in place so this can be a longer term, if need be, um, option. Or even as a supplementary. So if we have a student that maybe is having some school avoidance, maybe we can use this as part of our home visits as well to kind of help with the desensitization and trans transitioning back to school. So we are definitely thinking this would be more of a long-term offering. Yeah, I'm hopeful it will be useful too uh, for um, parents or guardians that have a hard time coming into the school. Maybe they're concerned about their confidentiality. You know, maybe they're just, um, you know, unable because of other, you know, childcare needs. Um, and we, it, it'll be an easy way for us to, um, you know, continue therapy with the family. Mm -hmm. Um, this is very helpful. I, uh, you know, I've learned a lot already this evening. I, I'd be interested in hearing from um, some of the administrators, Lisa, for example. What are your thoughts on on this program? I just, I'd love to hear your candid feedback and your reactions and thoughts, not just uh, about the last four years, but looking ahead. Um, sure. Thank you. Um, I guess I would say that. Uh, my thoughts kind of um, go along with what um, Mike Rizzo said, that it is a partnership that continues it continues to grow and that it provides a level of therapeutic care that if you're going to have these students in the school, which we do believe is best that they are part of the Western community and they're yeah. in a place that we need um, a therapeutic care component or rather tier three in, um, in the program. Um, I think that um, this is the best year we've had in the four years that it's been operational. I think that, that Cheryl and Lisa um, would agree. You know, um, it's the, the, our relationship has continued to grow. Um, you know, over the four years, um, there was, and with all transparency, there was some staffing issues. Some, you know, people had babies. What are you gonna do? You're gonna get a new person. And other staff, um, you know, moved around. So, so we had about eight or nine different clinicians and we spoke to ESS about it. The two we had this year were really, really terrific. They modeled things like um, the ESS mingle, which Lisa was talking about, like our ad mingle. They made themselves much more available to work on the communica communication between the um, academic teachers and the academic teachers felt that there was much more, you know, give and take, I would say, with the communication. Um, so that's positive. The goal, the, their two goals were basically like, let's increase academic time because we are concerned about that, about we wanted them to be in class. That was one of their goals. And then the other was to um, implement uh, DBT with Fidelity in their program. And we are very fortunate because one of the clinicians was a trained DBT person. I think she might even be a trainer, right? I mean, so that, that kind of aligns well. Where we have gone back and forth, and I think it is a healthy dialogue, is in um, some of the data collection. You know, they have a, a different organization, a different way of looking at some of the data, and um, we spoke about that um, because they report, for example, they do daily absences. We don't do daily absences, we look at period attendance which is it's a different lens by which to look at it. Mike referenced the uh, discipline. Um, it's true, our, our kids are pretty compliant on the discipline thing. The other thing I would say is, you know, it's very difficult when we kind of generalize and we're only talking about 16 kids and we pride ourselves on knowing those 16, well, well, 800 students. Who are they and what's going on with them? So, you know, you, you might say like, oh, this increased or this decreased 
and but there's only 16 kids so so for example you know we have let's say with discipline nine of the kids aren't really a discipline problem anyway it's so the the, the percentage yeah. of the other ones in the program you're looking at like nine and seven thank you lisa it's that kind of thing or someone that might have been strong in academics um you know to say that they increased their grades the grades were consistent but that in itself is an achievement because of all the emotional overlays mm -hmm. so i think that um you know this was the best year that we had we continue to really look and I, i'm all about drilling down into the data and looking at specific kids and what's going on like you know it might look great that you were here on a daily basis but why'd you keep missing that world studies class every morning that kind of thing so we have to kind of keep our focus on that and how to really get to look at those you know how specifically to move it forward um with all of those uh students because you know they each present with what i would say is significant significant issues that that we need to be supportive about and i just want to back off of that if you don't mind but i just want to say you know lisa you pushed us to really uh in our data to kind of shift how we were doing it and out of all the programs that we have currently, I mean, you know each and every student, you know how well they're doing. When we're reviewing data, it's not just that snapshot that you guys see. We're going through each kid, we're talking about all these data points that you have requested. And it's definitely, it's, it's definitely, I think, uh, really helpful to see them in that light as well. So I, I wanna thank you for pushing us to kind of shift how we're doing things. And in fact, how collaboration is how we can be successful as we can, right? So I, I wanna thank you for that. Yeah, and I think that like the the future goals are are good ones too. You know, we're trying to align everything. And the one thing I, I want to encourage is is that you know we got positive feedback from five of the sixteen. And I'm always looking at well, let's get feedback from all of them. How can we increase that? But what are you know what are the other eleven saying? Because what they're saying could help us then perhaps reach more students. Right, and and the and the not so successful stories are as important as the successful ones in data collection. Mm -hmm. And that that should be reflected, yeah. Or the why behind, because a lot of times we know the why behind, and it might have nothing to do with anything anybody's doing. It could be something, well, like this COVID, for example, right. you know, right. that is totally an unintended consequence. Yeah. Uh, Taffy, if I may, th this has been a, a real growing experience with ESS, and the decision was made before I, I arrived that ESS would be here. And Lisa, as you know, is a tough love principal, both with her students, but also with any external entity. Mm -hmm. And and Elise Taff, you may resonate with this. When I arrived, and there, it was growing pains. I described it as sort of a school within a school. And, and th those have not always worked well because the larger school rejects that insertion of another school. I mean, this is a whole program for those 10, 15, 16 students. But I really credit Lisa, and she's being open and honest with you. Four years ago, it was a struggle. Uh, and we worked with ESS, we talked with ESS, because we kept looking at the financial bottom line and said, there's a real reason to stay in this, but if it's not working, well, it's not. So every year, right. every year, right. and that's why it's grown now to, I think, be highly, no pun intended, effective. But mm -hmm. it's effective because we keep communicating, and, and Lisa is very clear and open with me about what's working and not. And we wouldn't be here going for the, now, I guess, fifth or sixth year, unless we are confident and it's year by year relationship that it's a learning and growing relationship. And we are seeing a, a real value add for this set of students. But I got to credit Lisa for being very strong on that and, and working with ESS. And I thank ESS for being patient with us as we frankly push you and nudge and all the rest to be a good partner. Thank you. And, and that goes both ways. I certainly appreciate um, Lisa and, and all the administrators' patience with us as we um, found the right team for Weston High School. Any other questions from the board? I have finding, a by finding the right team, you meant um, working with the right sort of leaders within the school to help our support clinic. Well, I, I meant our clinical staff, like to find the right clinical yeah. staff. We um, had a little bit of transition that, that Lisa was talking about earlier. Okay, that we gotcha. Back, but, and so we finally did find two two clinicians that are vet, you know, that are, are there. They're there to stay. They're vested in the community, and um, uh, you know, and they they seem to be a good fit overall, just on various different levels. Great. 
But I would also add that um, Lisa has helped um, in terms of our weekly administrative meeting um, to expand that. So we have the vice principals and the head of guidance involved, and that has really helped us in terms of our communication and collaboration. Um, it's it's good to have you know that kind of uh, group to work together. Any other questions? I I think I think okay. not. Um, well, um, well, I had a few questions. Okay. Okay. Um, one is I, I know everyone wants to you know there's a lot on the agenda, but tier one and tier two. Can you talk about tier one and tier two? What your involvement is, if at all, and if you're not involved, who is involved, and you know how that transition is made, just so I have a better understanding of it. Sure. With tier one and tier two, we're not. I mean, tier one we provide in the district. We do. We uh, do um, PD. Um, so actually, that's more of the, the bottom tier. But for tier one and tier two, and supporting students um, directly, we don't provide that at Weston. We provide it as a company. But for us, we're contracted just to do the tier three services. So um, we work. We collaborate with CSP and those members to kind of talk about transition plans when they start to step down to tier two. Um, but we're, we're providing more of the tier three support. Yeah, so, so it would be the um, the counselors and the social workers um, that are, you know, working with the students. And when their interventions aren't enough, that's when we get the referral because um, we can provide that more intensive. The students see uh, um, are in group with us. Um, I think it's five out of eight days. Um, and we see them individually once a week. So we were able to provide more intensive services for those that need it. And um, I, I wanted to talk about your goals. Lisa spoke with, you know, a little bit about it, but is your goal for the district for us not to need you? Like, what is your, what is your goal ultimately? Um, I, I mean, I think our goal is just to provide mental health supports for, for the districts and the students. I mean, some of our districts end up trying to, you know, Move on, and but many of our districts, we are there for a long period of time um, because we are a specialized clinical program. Our staff is well clinical. Um, we have a lot of supervision and support. So, like our staff that's there, like Cheryl, Cheryl said, she's the regional director. She's there every week doing um, treatment planning. So we're going through because we do have high risk students. Like these are the students that maybe they were, they just are stepping down from a hospitalization or had a suicide attempt and need services. So. Um, typically, when we're in a district, I mean, our goal is just to provide the best support. I think it depends on the vision of the district. Um, but for the most part, I mean, we were in a lot of districts for eight, nine years just partnering with this particular support for the students because it is a, a higher level of intensity of clinical support. But in a school building, one, you, you know, the case managers are doing PPT meetings and all these other pieces. They don't necessarily have the time. And uh, our staff are staff that have really primarily worked in uh, you know, partial hospitalizations, hospitals, and, and more intensive therapeutic setting. If I may, from a district perspective, and Mike, you might fill in, but to be direct in the transition, others of us not, not need, to, need to be able to answer these things. I think the vision for the district is how do we have within district opportunities for students who may otherwise have to go out of district? So that's why in this presentation, you heard so much about that, that out of district. For some children being and, and young adults, and many are, being out of district is the best thing. For others, though, how do we have our services in district? So it's not a perfect comparison, but it's that idea of the school within a school, or a comp better phrased, a comprehensive program for students with mental health and emotional needs. It, we, Despite how good we are, despite how well staffed we are, they would have to go out of district if we did not have this program. So. It's, it's ongoing daily capacity building for the students and support for the staff, but it's it's not a partnership that then a year or two or three from now, away ESS goes and we have that capacity. And it, they're providing us a within district program for students that otherwise those students would have to go out of district to obtain. I think that's well said, Bill, and I, and I would add, um, you know, the services that ESS provides is an, it's another stop on the continuum of services for all of our students. And then the stop that this is for some students is 
you know, sometimes the final stop before we, we would say we, we cannot meet the needs of the students within the district. So it's another opportunity with a highly set of uh, clinical, you know, clinically based um, therapy to, to work with students and their families. So it, it really does provide something that, um, you know, we, it would be very, very difficult to provide um, otherwise. The other, the other thing I would say is it goes the other way too. So we have had students, as, as Cheryl mentioned, where they have been in a uh, therapeutic setting, you know, outside of the district, and it is used as a step down. So coming, bringing them back into into the uh, high school, for example, uh, with with that level of therapeutic support and care. So it can work both ways. It's you know, it's it's a, and again, to ESS's credit, I think that they've been, they certainly have their program and and their protocols, and they have been flexible with implementing those to meet our needs, which is very helpful. And I think. Uh, Mike, I, I think from a, you know, um, from a budgetary cost perspective, I think that's how we have to look at the cost trade off. Uh, because the alternative uh, would be, uh, you know, from a just from a budgetary point of view, would be a lot more costly for the district. I would I would agree with that, Tony. Um, and just uh, while we're on this point of the contract, um, I'll just mention quickly too that um, ESS did this year keep their rat their rate flat for us. <laughs> Um, which was uh, very helpful. And they provide and have provided in the past uh, no charge ESY services if we uh, sign the contract by a certain date. So uh, they've been very cognizant of, of the district's uh, financial uh, situation as well, which is helpful. Great. Well, if there's no other questions, um, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl and Lisa and Mike for uh, making us a lot smarter on ESS tonight. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. You all do well. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Um, now for another small topic, the uh, annual instructional update. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good to be with you tonight, and uh, you know we've we've already had almost a uh, two-hour-long um, meeting on this this important topic, and uh, will not go unnoticed that in addition to our leadership team made up of all the administrators and curriculum leaders for the district, um, you know we had the curriculum committee along with uh, several other board members join us. So um, you know obviously this is at the core of our work. You know the instruction is what we're all about. It's uh, obviously uh, central to our mission and uh, you know just very pleased you know every year to just have the opportunity um, to share the you know the accomplishments the challenges uh, and to just to really be reflective uh, with the board and the, and, and the community uh, through the written document through the conversation um, you know, I think uh, it, it's so critical that we, we don't rest on our laurels and, and just continue to to try to grow and improve. So uh, I just, you know, at the outset, want to um, you know just thank all the teachers uh, for their for their hard work. Um, you know, obviously we've set goals for this year, which are uh, identified in the document, and you know the work of the curriculum leaders with those teachers, with the support of the administration and their guidance. You know, has helped us, um, you know, really realize, uh, you know, in, in, in really a two-part year, um, a lot of goals and challenges. So the first part of the year, obviously, was uh, business as usual, and we were working very hard in every area and across buildings on um, on, on raising the, the level of uh, instruction. And then uh, when distance learning hit, it was how do we continue to you know, make a big shift, <clears throat> dramatic shift, but then uh, continue to build on that as we moved along into the phase three approach. So uh, we've reflected quite a bit on the distance learning and, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're proud of where we are. We know that if uh, distance learning continues into the fall, we have a good foundation to build on and we know that there's, you know, there's, there's certainly things um, you know, we can learn from uh, this experience. Uh, there are, I think, what is very interesting to maybe families, uh, you know, they, you look through the document, you see uh, at the end, we left an appendix of 
um, videos and you know samples of, of the work um, that, that teachers have accomplished, which I think is uh, unique to this particular edition of the annual instructional update. And we do plan tomorrow uh, to push out to all families the, act, the annual instructional update with a, with a note regarding it. I think it's something that uh, you know certainly all families uh, should see, skim through, or read closely, with, given how the you know, time allows. But uh, you know it's it, it's important work. So um, you know we've had a great opportunity for for uh, question and answer, uh, but certainly you know tonight is just another opportunity if um, you have questions. Um. I also want to, Tony, were you about to say something? Uh, I was going to ask a question, but go ahead, Taffy, first. Uh, you know, I'll save my comments for the end of this section, this item. Thank you. Okay. Um, no, it's it's uh, always an impressive piece of work. Um, one comment and, and a question. One of the things that might be helpful um, to front load in the future, I don't know how everyone feels about this, is to basically have your goals and accomplishments in more of a summary form with maybe a, you know, almost like a green, yellow, red, which is like th these goals, you know, we, you know, these accomplishments versus our goals we really met. These we kind of did, but maybe needs work. And these we kind of maybe fell short a little bit and we have to focus on for, for, for the next year. Um, it, it's in there, but it's, it, you have to read all through it. I'm wondering if there's a way of taking, you know, not to trivialize it, but to more summarize where we are versus our goals in a way that we can, you know, sort of almost have a template to track year after year. Yeah, and they should, yeah, and they should be aligned. The goals and the accomplishments should be aligned, as I think we discussed in the meeting. Yeah, yeah, that's that was you know it's all in there. It just has to, I think, be be summarized and brought out. And the other thing is is you know um, is the whole you know distance learning. I'll bring this up always in my question, which is we we can't um, you know we 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 can't kind of forget. Um, what we've learned during this crisis that might help us reimagine things and just be better at what we do in the future by um, enhancing the tools that we, or increasing the number of tools we have in our toolbox. And I think that's that's got to be a constant theme because I think we've learned a lot and I think what we've learned could augment what we already do well uh, in the future and not not to just say now we're sometime in the future back to normal let's just forget about i, I think um this this is a great opportunity to um to take those things we've learned and to uh even do better in the future yeah thank you for that tony and you know really um giving you know giving us some thoughts on you know how we might make this um you know an easier read uh for next year it is quite dense you know, we had on the agenda for June curriculum committee just a you know brief debrief of this process. So you're just you're kind of you know giving us a prelude into that and what may be you know helpful to the board and the community. And, and certainly, um, you know, as we did this year, having to adjust and shift the way we present it, you know, we want to uh, we want to do that for next year as well to meet to meet the needs. Uh, and your comment about distance learning and reimagining things, um, you might think, well, maybe maybe we don't need snow days anymore. We can actually <laughs> use what we've learned uh, yeah. to, to get those days in. Uh, and there are many other things. I mean, certainly in the way, um, you know, work is delivered, um, you know, we, we, we're going to learn from this. And I think we're going to be uh, hopefully better for it when we uh, get back to um, in-school learning. Yeah. Um, I know we have a big agenda, so I, I just I wanted to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, it was a really, really, for, especially for those who may be listening who are not here on this call, but um, the meeting was really extraordinary. Um, the reports from the teachers were extraordinary, and and they um, they really demonstrated how um, committed they are to making this work. Um, how committed they are to spending every possible hour figuring out what's working and what's not working. 
and digging deep into what's not working and helping it, um, you know, move along in advance. And I think that really impressed us. And we, we, at the end of the meeting said to ourselves, how can we communicate the passion and dedication that we've seen on this call to families? And the reason I'm saying that now is because I've received some letters um, in the last few weeks over the time of, since the shutdown, um, you know, of people that aren't happy and people that are, are concerned about um, how much time their kids are getting um, with online learning and live learning and live teaching hours, et cetera. And, you know, we do not have all the answers and the teachers don't have all the answers and we're figuring it out. But I just wanted to say that I have never felt more reassured than I did um, at that meeting to hear that the administrators and the staff are doing everything they can to figure out this unprecedented problem. And so I just, I, I wanted to put that out to everyone to let you know that first of all, keep the letters coming because they're important data. Um, the letters that say, my child isn't getting enough, my child is getting too much, my child isn't, you know, that's really good data. So we will, I welcome those letters and I think my colleagues do as well. Um, and I'm passing them on to Bill and to Ken and to others. But please be reassured that um, the, uh, the staff has, is, has really dug in and is not gonna let up or sleep until we've resolved this and that we know that our kids are gonna get the very best as is our standard here in Weston. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Anything else, any other questions, comments? Great, thank you. Thank you, Ken, and thanks for the entire staff for and administration for uh, um, just for everything you do. I think it's a document, but this document is kind of what what we do here in Weston. It's it's a it's just a articulation of everything we do. Um, with that, distance learning update. Good segue. Ken, you want to launch into that? Um, I might say just quickly that we, later in the agenda, we've got the fall 2020 opening update. And part of that for sure, if not substantially that relates to distance learning. So I think this discussion is kind of where we are now. When we get to fall 2020, that'll be where we're headed, if that helps kind of manage time and questions and interests of the board, if that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Ken, take it away. Sure. So, you know, I, this really follows on the annual instructional update. We, you know, we're really, we're, we're in a rhythm now, uh, between now uh, and the end of the year, the last few weeks of school. Um, you know, we have evolved over the past, uh, you know, couple of months. And, you know, as I, as I mentioned, we, we now, um, you know, we now see, we see areas of strength, we see areas potentially of growth. I mean, we have, as, as Taffy said, I mean, you know, we have, um, we, we've received some uh, some thanks. We've also uh, received some constructive feedback uh, to consider, you know, how can we have uh, students uh, see their teacher more frequently? Um, you know, one of my reflections has been, you know, K-5 versus six twelve two very different experiences, two very different developmental situations. Uh, on one hand, at the high school level, uh, you have uh, live classes on a, uh, a scheduled basis over the course of a week. And uh, we should not forget that at the high school level, students have many teachers. Um, and so, uh, and generally they're meeting uh, in large group with those teachers and over uh, you know, the course of the week, there are times where, you know, they're, they're meeting individually for questions or for small group and, and for, for specialized needs. K-5, on the other hand, um, is very unique and probably a uh, more challenging uh, developmental situation for families and for students, just given the, uh, the age of the students. But, you know, we are extremely proud at the WIS. Uh, I mean, many students um, you know, have developed some independent skills 
uh, to be able to facilitate their learning. We, we know at K2, um, you know, parents are, are, are very much involved, um, but we should not forget that the, the K5 level, uh, many times, the, 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 you know, except for maybe fifth grade, uh, for the core curriculum, students have primarily one teacher. And we've made a strategic move at the K-5 level that students um, will meet with those teachers in small groups. So while the current model is that students are meeting two to three times a week, uh, at least uh, with, their, with their teachers in small groups and, and, and uh, maybe uh, supplemented with some individual meetings for, for some specialized needs, uh, those teachers then have to meet uh, multiple times with, with various groups in their class. So to meet two to three times a week with students, it's 10 to 15 uh, meetings, live classes um, that teachers have scheduled. Now that said, uh, in recent conversations with, with Patty uh, regarding the WISP, we've even talked about, you know, just even how do you encourage teachers, you know, and can, continue to build uh, you know, their repertoire for, for students to be able to see them. And whether that's building their face more into the videos that they're, they've created and things of that nature, uh, because we know families are craving that. And I think um, this, is, this is really the foundation for uh, the task force when we're getting feedback from, from, from teachers, administrators, and parents on Sort of uh, next steps, you know, if we're in, high, you know, if we're in distance learning in the fall, either in part or whole. So um, that's sort of my update. Um, certainly, if there's questions for particular principals, I think they're on the line uh, as well. Um, what, you know, Ken? Um, I guess this is for the principals as well. Um, you know, um, you know, we we understand also the challenges that you know the themes in terms of the challenges that the teachers are facing and trying to address them um, in what parents and students are facing in terms of especially in the lower schools is there a theme there that's emerging that basically where uh yourself mm -hmm. and and the teachers are saying okay this is this is where we need to focus on next is there you know a common theme emerging that you're grabbing onto and say, okay, if we need to evolve in this, di this direction, this is where we need to go next. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Sure, and, and, and Tony, I think, you know, for that, we may be, um, you know, I think our June curriculum committee meeting will be a good place for some of the uh, reflections and the principal may have some comments at you know, this point, but, uh, you know, we're still, you know, we're still collecting um, you know, we're getting feedback from families and from teachers. We meet weekly with um, with the WTA as well. Um, so it's you know it's it's good to continue to to, to gather that that information. But um, you know, in terms of um, in, in terms of the learning, there's a lot of anecdotal information from from teachers just talking to them one on one, from mm -hmm. families. Um, and I think you know some of the some of the common themes are is, is um, you know I've mentioned I think from 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 families uh, you know they they continue you know at, at the um, at, at the at the middle school would would continue to like to see um, you know this this kind of uh, live teaching continue can continue I think that was a really good move by Dan and his staff building in that schedule like the high school. At the K five level, um, you know, how do you, you know, how how can you figure out where where students can somehow see their their teacher more? Um, but then balancing that with, you know, the 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 ability to actually have kids be able to to, to focus and um, you know be able to do that, particularly at the youngest level when they need some parental support. So um, those are some things. But principals, if you'd like to jump in, feel free. I would just say that in my conversations with teachers at the middle school, um, what we're finding right now, I think, is just um, that there seems to be a level of burnout on the part of our students who we're having we're struggling to keep them engaged, um, to really, um, you know, to make sure that they're accessing their teachers, uh, reading the communications from their teachers, participating in the live sessions. 
know, we feel that sometimes our, our students are there, um, their microphones may be off, sometimes their cameras are off. And we're, we're learning from each other strategies, like I think Lisa shared with the principals about if, um, you know, when you break them into smaller groups, students tend to have their, mic their cameras on more frequently. So those are the conversations that we're having. It's how to keep the students engaged. Uh, it's, it's interesting that some of our students um, are actually shining in this distance learning environment. Um, these are some students who may, maybe would have struggled uh, back in, in school, but it's working both ways. We're seeing uh, different students um, respond differently to the distance learning. And I think our greatest concern now that it's been going on for so long is the toll that it's taking on uh, our students' emotional health, the social isolation. Our counselors are working really hard uh, to engage with students and their families uh, when, we, when we hear the stories that, that students are struggling emotionally. I would reiterate what um, Dan said. Um, we're seeing now that it's, because it's been so long, um, struggles also um, with the social emotional piece. I was on the phone with one of the counselors and she said, Lisa, I have on speed dial five kids I call every morning, call them every morning. And I think that, um, you know, the impact that this is having on our students, I don't think anybody, I don't think we could have anticipated it because more and more things are happening. Um, mm -hmm. that we have to be aware of. Somebody loses his job. Somebody, you know, it, it's, you, you keep hearing all these stories. This one is sick. This one has this. This grandmother came to live. They're afraid of this. They're afraid of that. There's a lot, a lot of um, layers of all that. So I think mm -hmm. that our challenge for next year will be, you know, we have certain academic things that we're looking at and whatever happens next year with this. And if there's still components of this distance learning of how to really, um, strengthen that connection with our families to make sure that the students are, not that nobody's falling through the cracks, mm -hmm. I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. That's what I worry about. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there's really this theme of the social emotional learning, Tony, and I think, you know, just variability too between students, differentiation, um, you know, becomes critically important. And then if we're in distance learning again, you know, how do you differentiate within this environment, um, you know, so those are two, th I mentioned that at the curriculum committee meeting and, and I think you're hearing that here from Dan and Lisa too. Yeah. And I can just add at the, um, at the primary level, you know, bringing students just into this platform and into this online world was such an undertaking, um, but we really are seeing the same things I think as the secondary schools and I think at WIS too, that now we're looking at how do we get students more engaged, make the um, the live sessions more interactive and more meaning, you know, more meaningful and get the most out of them that we can. Uh, we are thinking ahead to, you know, probably needing something next year in terms of distance learning. So our teachers are starting to try some of those, um, those platforms out, you know, to enhance them. You know, for the early elementary level, it really is a challenge for the families. Our students are not completely independent yet. We're at the middle and high school level. Um, students can pretty much get themselves online. They can check in on what their assignments are and they can sustain independent work for a period of time. Um, when you're talking about three, four, five and six year olds, they need a level of, um, of family support. And that really has been a big challenge for our families. We are very much aware of that. And we've, um, we've reached out and tried to support the families too as much as possible while also keeping um, the students engaged in learning. Um, you know, even at the early level though, we've seen, I think what some of the other schools have seen, some of the students are really thriving. Um, and as always, you know, I think what we do well in Weston is really personalizing. Yeah. I, I echo everything that both Dan and or oh, Laura, Dan, Lisa said, um, you know, we are, it, it's a continually evolving process. I think and the thing that really is, um, is how collaborative our teams have become. Our teachers work so closely all the time. I mean, we're constantly on uh, meeting times. They're sharing. They're talking about ideas. This worked. This wasn't so great. Maybe we could tweak this, and um, which has been really, um, uh, really great for everybody, for the, the kids as well as the the, the teachers. Um, I, I there has been a little bit of um, a decline in you know kids getting a little bit 
tired and um, having to try to keep them engaged. We realize, you know, our kids our age, they're social beings. So it's not just the academic, it's really that social component that we really keep trying to weave in and trying to make sort of these little fun times that we do. So it's not all content, content, content. Um, um, so we're really aware of that. And I think our teachers are more aware of it than ever, even having those Wednesday um, meta moment days uh, in our morning announcements, just trying to keep that, that conversation about social emotional uh, um, alive every single week is I think is really helpful to our kids. Um, and um, so, you know, it's, I, I, I welcome the feedback uh, because I think it helps us all because we can't be in all the homes. So we know what's happening there. It helps us to react in school as well. So um, it's a process. <laughs> Yeah, uh, just, uh, it I just, just, I just hope, go ahead. I just hope you don't feel, you know, when I said earlier that there are letters coming, et cetera, you know, those letters are also acknowledging the work that yeah. you're doing and the teachers are doing. So I just, I want to make sure that you know, um, that we know, uh, this is a living process and you've been as heroic as first responders can be in such a situation. So I just, you know, and, and what I really respect, uh, Patty, is when you're saying, you know, the teachers are talking to each other and saying what's not working, what is working and figuring it out. They're problem solving. And if there's anything we want our children to become, it's problem solvers. And they're gonna learn from you just by your energy. So anyway, just had to, I, I feel for you. I just, I can't believe you're getting, you know, when you said that you're getting these phone calls um, or the teachers are making five phone calls every morning. I mean, that's just exquisite. It's exquisite. So thank you. Can I have a quick question um, with regards to K through five? Is some, I'm getting some uh, questions from parents in terms of, is there going to be kind of another phase between now and the end of school year in terms of doing things differently? Or is the way that K through five is being run right now, that's how it will be maintained for the next three and a half, four weeks? Yeah, good question, Ruby. So the model uh, will not change. However, we know that um, our teachers are working on a regular basis to improve what they're doing. I mean, they're engaging on these flex days in professional growth. Um, so where some, you know, uh, you know, maybe uh, they may be using video differently so that students can can see them more as we go along. And I know principal, I know Patty even is early as late as today, um, right? Patty had uh, given more encouragement to try to, you know, you, you know, do it. If you can do it more in that respect with seeing your students within this framework, please, please do so. But, you know, there's there's no phase four between now and the end of the year, but there is okay. continuous, you know, continuous improvement. And there's still a lot of learning going on that, that teachers are applying in their work with each other. Right. OK, so then my next question is just around and I think this is more for Hurl, but is just the accountability piece and almost like a end of the year check-in in terms of where the student is at and maybe what they should be focusing on over the summer, just so that when assessment starts, because I know even Mike has alluded to, there's gonna be, assessment is going to be um, very deep, right? When, when Once we begin school next year in terms of assessing each student, where they are, are they at the appropriate place and how can we get them there? Is there any type of assessment that we could probably do at the end of this year and almost give um, a synopsis of this is where your child's at, this is where possibly they could use some extra help in over the summer so that when they come into school next year, um, they will be kind of on target. H have we started to think about any of that type of dialogue to have with each individual family? Sure, sure. So, yes, I can. Yeah, um, why don't you go ahead, Laura? Sure, so we've been talking about that a lot, Ruby, at Hurlbutt, um, right. and really starting to think about how do we transition everybody into that summer time, and also thinking about next year. We actually, um, we're a little surprised. We actually have some really good data from this, um, and I, I do think that from distance learning, what we've been able to do with the students does tell a little bit of a story. 
Um, there's quite a bit of variability, of course. You know, each family is unique, each situation is unique. So um, I, I think as I, I remember the last meeting we were in <clears throat> and at the annual instructional update, all the principals talked about this. I think we're, we're gonna see a wide range um, some students are really thriving and, and excelling and, you know, moving up reading levels and other families are in a different place right now for a lot of different reasons. So, um, we are in the process of gathering some data, um, for us to look at. Uh, we're still teaching. There's still a lot of learning happening as Ken said. So, you know, we don't have that final mm -hmm. look yet. Um, the curriculum instructional leaders and I talked about that today. You know, what does that tell us? What's the story? What does that mean moving forward? What does that mean that information mean for us if we are in distance learning again and at the end of August and September? Um, the data is different than what we typically have at the end of the school year. So I do think it takes a little digging in and understanding. Um, and I we have talked about, um, you know, giving some recommendations for for the summer. Yeah. in our end of year narratives and we do um we are, have been planning on that last week of school while there's still learning happening that week it's also a transitional week how do we start to get students excited about what they can continue over the summer summer reading is going to look very different this year i think than it has in the past we have no indication that the libraries will open this summer um and if they do what you know what the possibilities are for reading so a lot of that is in the works right now we've been thinking about it a lot Great. So, Laura, um, pick up on what you just said. This curriculum council meeting, where leadership and the SILs meet on Wednesday, um, you know, a couple of these items that you mentioned, Ruby, are on, are on the agenda. Um, you know, we're going to be looking at how do we provide resources, and we do. You know, we normally provide resources in the form of, you know, reading lists and things of that nature over the summer and even in math, but. Um, you know, even ramping up those efforts this year uh, throughout the system to provide families with optional resources and maybe, um, you know, doing things differently too with, with reading lists and things like that because, you know, the you know, library may not be accessible. Um, but the other thing in terms of, you know, and I think Laura's really alluding to more qualitative information that we're, we're gathering now regarding student progress. Um, the end of the year progress reports K-5 will be in narrative form. So there is an opportunity there, you know, you know how we have, we typically have had standards and comment sections. So the focus is on the comment sections these at, at the end of the year. Uh, and certainly, uh, you, know, you know, that'll be an opportunity to share how students are doing regarding their, their progress. Um, so, you know, again, I think uh, thinking about the summer, thinking about where students and benchmarking where they are. Now, you know, you're, in the fall, certainly if we were are in school, we'll, we'll be able to do a lot more of the traditional kinds of assessments. But if we're still in a distance learning mode in part or whole, um, we may have to think, we mean, you know, need to mm -hmm. rethink that. And what's, what's the best way to determine, for example, how does a student, you know, how do we identify a student who needs more support in terms of their literacy at, at the lower levels? And would we have to rely more on the teacher expertise in terms of where they see that student in relation to grade level benchmarks? Um, so. Thank you. Any other? Uh any other questions on distance learning right now? No, let's, there isn't, let's move to the next topics, which I've been looking forward to, which is end of year events for all schools. Bill? Yeah, let me, let me start quickly. That's first to, just is to compliment the principals and they're about to share with you their end of year plans. And uh, decentralization okay. is, is a fabulous quality of Weston. So off they charge the principals to figure out these very, dare I say, high stakes moments, particularly the high school graduation, uh, the moving up ceremony, eighth grade, then transitions out of the fifth grade and transitions out of the second grade to think that through as it made sense for each building, but then to have some coordination system wide. And in our new reality, their plans had to be approved by 
the Emergency Operations Center and the West and Westport Health District. Uh, and that, that's the nature of how things happen now and going forward. Um, so I don't know in what order or how they want to share. Uh, we share. We sent to you a full packet. The lead piece was the commissioner on Thursday giving the guidelines. Fortunately, our great team had already more than matched those uh, so that we were fine. Um, still a lot of work to do on these. Uh, at the very, very end, I'll mention something uh, that Lisa and I've talked about. I talked about in the chair and vice chair meeting this morning, but principals want you, however you're gonna update uh, we'll do that. And then there's some logistics, technical stuff I'll do at the end. But right now it's the celebratory piece I want you to speak to. So however you're organized, go. So I can start with Hurlbut. Um, for our, our um, transitioning second graders, we wanted to make sure that we had um, something memorable for them um, as they will not be returning in the new year to Hurlbut. So we have planned a drive-through parade for them on June 11th. Um, classes will be arriving in waves so that it will um, support the traffic flow and um, hopefully um, make sure that that moves as smoothly as possible. Um, you know, we're fortunate we have a very large bus loop where our buses um, drop off and pick up our students. So we'll, we are able to socially distance Teachers will be spread out at least six feet apart, wearing masks, um, but it will be um, at least, you know, sort of an in-person visual for the students to be able to see their teachers and be able to um, have a, some kind of a closure to the end of the school year and to their time with us at Hurlbut. Um, so we're, we're really excited about that. And then for the other grades, in, and also including second grade, each classroom always, um, ends the school year with some kind of a closure activity. Typically they're class parties, class gatherings. So our teachers are in the process of planning those events. Um, of course they will be virtual, but we are working hard to make sure that we give a sense of um, closure and also celebration to the school year. So I'll follow along. So our fifth grade, our, uh, we'll be doing a car parade as well. So we're having our fifth grade um, students and their families will uh, form a car parade coming down our main road, going through the pickup drop off line and proceeding along the front of the, the building where socially distanced, uh, appropriate uh, along the sidewalk will be our teachers and our staff members and so that they can wave goodbye and say goodbye to our fifth graders before they head to the middle school. Um, but also each year we always do something special to recognize our fifth graders and we, we want to do the same um, this year um, when we're in the building. We always do a, what we call a fifth grade celebration where the students and the staff um, and the parents come together in the cafetorium. We do a little cel um, celebration. We talk, uh, Mrs. Wilhelm and I speak um, and they, we do a slideshow. So we want to do that this year as well but it'll just be online rather than uh, in person. So we'll, um, Mrs. Wilhelm and I, along with some of our teachers, will do some video recordings. Um, then our fifth grade, uh, fifth grade students and Ms. Sabini are currently working on their traditional slideshow, um, which each of our students gets to put together. They have a, a each have a slide that, with a picture and their favorite memories from WIS. So we'll put all that together in one big slideshow that we'll send out to our kids as well. And then our PTO is buying um, shirts for all of our fifth graders. So um, as a farewell, so they'll, they will um, receive those. Um, and like Laura said, you know, all of our classrooms will do their own individual end of the year celebrations of some sort virtually. Um, and as we know those plans, we will get be getting those out to families and to students as soon as we know them. And um, we know it's an unusual year, but we really, really are trying to make the time to make it special and um, to celebrate all of our students. So I'll follow up next with the middle school. We're trying to hold on to as many of the traditions as we can while still doing social distancing. So I'm very pleased that our, our WMS PTO eighth grade um, parent reps are still continuing the tradition of the photo montage where they collect photos uh, from pre-K all the way through eighth grade and put those together, set it to music, and we'll have that available for students. And we are also um, following the same tradition that we've followed in the past with giving students or selling students the uh, class of 2024 
t-shirts that they can traditionally wear on their first day of high school, whenever that may be when they get back uh, into the building. Um, our team leaders and the eighth grade teachers and counselor, along with the administrators, are putting together a, uh, a video moving up ceremony. So we're hoping to have as many elements as we would normally have at our moving up ceremony, including um, the announcement of prizes, uh, advice from the eighth grade teachers as the students move on to high school, a student speaker, all of those elements uh, we plan to do in a video that we'll send out uh, to, um, to the families. And then to cap it all off, uh, following the tradition of what uh, Laura and Patty talked about, we also will have a car parade on the morning of June 12th. Um, and this means a lot to our families and to our students. Um, they were talking about how badly they wanted to do something like this physically. So they'll be able to drive through in the same format that Laura and Patty described, um, just the eighth graders uh, driving through campus. We sent out directions today announcing it. They'll be coming in off of Weston Road, driving past the high school, and then entering our bus loop, uh, driving past the middle school with teachers wearing masks, socially distancing, and holding signs congratulating them. So we're looking forward to celebrating the end of middle school with our eighth graders. Lisa, it's over to you. Lisa? <laughs> I'm sorry. I was trying to get the microphone unmuted. Um, so, I mean, you read the plans. Um, it's going to be spectacular. I told the students, um, you know, it's not what the students wanted. I'll say that up front. They kept envisioning other things, but we spent a lot of time talking to uh, Sergeant Michelli and Captain Berdaki and West in Westport Health District. Um, and it, you know, it breaks my heart. I got a couple of emails immediately saying, Mrs. Wallach, we didn't, we don't want this. We want this. Well, there's going to be surprises along the way of our graduation procession. Um, and it's going to be beautiful. And I'm not going to disclose some of the surprises. Um, but um, you know, I'm really proud of um the plan and all the work that went into the plan and um I really appreciate the the um, you know the police's guidance and um, the um, director at the uh, Western Health and uh, the Western Westport Health District because they helped greatly with their suggestions and uh, we're looking forward to it being a spectacular um, a spectacular send off for them. Um, you could see in the in the uh, correspondence I send out. What is exciting is that the Fox is going to broadcast that. And fun fact, fun fact that um, I don't think anyone knows is that June Safferstein, who works with um, Phil, her brother is the person that reached out to us because he works for the Fox. And I guess all these radio stations each said they would try to take one high school. So we're really very grateful for that, that they will be able to live broadcast it and then we'll have the NFHS network and we're going to make the program. You know, the kids are like, we didn't, we don't want a virtual program. Well, you're getting both because your families and your grandparents and your extended family and friends are going to watch, want to watch that whole program. So it'll be great. Lisa, um, this, this it's <laughs> fantastic. Uh, the, um, how, how many, how many staff do you anticipate to be outside on on this on that day? Um, quite a few. Um, so that's the next step. What we are going to do, um, the staff, they were only asking the high school staff to be there. And of course, um, the Board of Ed and some key central mm -hmm. office people, such as Dr. McCarthy, who has to certify the class. Right. Um, but um, there are staff that want to, the next step in our plan is, and we're gonna be, again, working with um, with the uh, police on that, is this gonna be a map of how that is going to be set up. Okay. Because okay. we have to be very clear, uh, clear and careful. And it depends on the number of staff that have indicated they wanna come and where will they be. I mean, you know, we have a long stretch on school road, a very long stretch. And what we wanted to do was kind of, 
mirror what we used to do at the end of the graduation when the kids walk through our line. But that being said, there's a lot of, obviously, the social distancing and the stops. So it, rest assured, it will all be done and clearly marked. But that's the next level of uh, detail that we have to have and to work also, on. Have you considered um, what you do with potential spectators? Okay. There, there is going to be no one on school road as a spectator. Okay. Um, it just, we can't have it. We, you know, we've talked to the police. Everyone's given one car that, you know, and the details are, we're in the letter and we said, you know, you're given one vehicle. And if anybody in anybody going with you, there has to be a seatbelt for that person, you know, because we also want to avoid things like, you know, 20 people crammed in the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> I certainly hope it wouldn't happen. Um, but it goes down school road and then they turn out, you know, the, the, the parade kind of turns out right. and people disperse. So if there were people that were along that area, that's kind of beyond our control. Right. But it would be very difficult given the timing and the the spacing and everything else to, to go much beyond that. That's why we're broadcasting in every way, shape, or form, and we're going to get that out to the uh, general public. Great. Um, just quick question. I would I would love a board of ed representation. Obviously, we know there's going to be representation at the graduation, but I also would love representation at Hurlbut, Wiss, and Middle School um, moving up kind of parades. So, will will that be allowed? Do I need to get clearance from anyone for that? We'll make sure that there's plenty of room. Okay. Not looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would love to have um, some board of ed reps there. We yeah. we haven't gotten to the point where we've um, mapped out the distances and marked the bus loop where people can stand. But um, you know, we'll let you know how many spots we have. Great, Great. perfect. Thank you. Uh, other questions for the principals. I was just thinking that um, if you wanted to do, you know, a little something special for these kids, I'm sure that, you know, the PTO philanthropies would be willing to contribute given the way that the year is um, mapped out. So I, I, if you wanted to get creative, I'm sure you'd get some, I would suspect you'd get support. Might be nice, given that I, it, you don't want it to be so anticlimactic for everybody. So. I, I would say to you that our PTO has been very supportive I'm sure the others have too. And again, this falls under surprises. That might happen. <laughs> yeah, the, the PTOs are incredibly generous, active and supportive and uh, very energetic. And so I think the principals work very well to help that energy be right where it needs to be. Good. Um, so good point, Hillary. But the, 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 excuse me, the PTO presidents who I by purpose meet a day or two after this monthly board meeting and we sent you that I think list of all the things they did during teacher appreciation week uh so there weston is very benefits greatly from the parents we have um let, let me just make one point lisa and i talked about earlier i brought it up with tony which might be the root of this question we definitely want staff and board of ed around but uh, Friday, I was in a statewide call with the commissioner. It's part of what went out on my weekend update. We just have to be just terribly serious about the social distancing, the wearing of masks. You know, I'm on campus every day. I've insisted on that with our everyone working here, the small number there are, and we just have to hold to that because you know we're in a situation where we're ahead of our science now. And even the, today, the governor pulled back on some openings on certain things because it, it's just a couple steps forward, a couple steps back. So we, we want this to be a wonderful celebration. And, and I just have to be clear and definite. Nothing that we look back on to say, oh, my goodness, we let the gatherings create issues for us. The plans are wonderful. They've been approved correctly. Um, and part of that Friday call was superintendents across the state saying to the commissioner, we just are struggling with this pivotal issue of high school graduation, the celebrations, how do we handle this in a safe way? And at least the acting director of public health was on the call 
former director of public health. I don't know if he's acting or not. He's been called back to help given the transition in that seat. But but we just have to do this do this correctly. And again, I really appreciate the principals working so carefully and thoughtfully, working with Joe Michelli so closely, and that'll continue on how many of us can be out there and where we have to stand uh, to be supportive. Um, the other big part of end of year is we closed fast. Uh, we're gonna reopen slowly. I heard that phrase this weekend, I think it's a powerful one. We closed fast, we had to, and but we're gonna reopen slowly. But part of the closing fast is belongings and other personal items are in the buildings. Um, and teachers and staff want to get access to that. Families and students want to get access to those things. But once again, we have to do that in ways that keep everybody healthy. So that was part of my weekend update. Uh, we, were, we had said early June we'd get something out. We're trying now to make that June 1 so that if staff are coming back in the buildings, they're doing that on their work time and not post June 12th because their last work day is the 12th of June. So we're working on that. Uh, we have a meeting tomorrow uh, with the principals, Ken, Mike Domastro. I'll sit in on it just to see that we keep this moving. The WTA via the CEA, Connecticut Education Association, is going to offer up some protocols because they're very concerned that things get done correctly. I think the protocols will all be manageable. But again, we're going to have to run all those plans through the EOC in the West and Westport Health District. So that, that's some basic end of year that if you're getting questions, board members, don't get caught in the middle, just redirect them either the, to the particular principal or into the superintendent's office. But we are trying to put those plans together. Um, I should say going back to the end of year celebrations, uh, particularly the graduation moving up ceremony or a, 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 a joyful heavy lift for our facilities team. This will also be a joyful heavy lift uh, so DeMastro will be part of meetings with Lisa, particularly at the high school. And uh, I think we'll want to pull, probably pull back in all of our security specialists to be of help on a lot of these things. Uh, so it'll be all hands on deck, but again, done in ways that protects everybody's health. So th that's the update on any of your events. I don't know if there are other questions from the board about any of this or other comments from any of the principals. Bill, um, yeah, you can move to the next topic. If there's no uh, comments or questions, we'll uh, go through the uh, right uh, the reopening plans right now. Okay. Um, I, I have a question for all those on the screen. You had it sent to you, and it's also in um, the, the meeting posting is the most recent document. Do you want me to try and screen share that? So we can all see it at the same time, or do you have that enough in your mind? I think we all probably have it in right in front of us. On yeah. Okay. All right. Um, because I, I want to be efficient here, and sometimes for me that means staying close to a script, not to read to you, but but stay close to a script. So um, the cover sheet that went out, and thank you, Meredith, for updating the cover sheet again today. Um, we had last week in a midweek note from me to the community announced, if you will, that we had what I'm calling the fall 2020 task force. That's the opening. Uh, obviously, given this is such a critical issue, it caught a lot of attention and people asked for more representation on that body. So we've rounded that out. Uh, we're modeling it on the school start end time task force, which was, I think, highly successful. And so you have in front of you board and public community on, and on this call, you know, it's posted and be widely distributed. Now that full task force and is now fully representative of all the different employee groups, parents, uh, the PTO will send in a couple nominations or appointees, if you will. The town's represented through Sergeant Joe Michelli. And obviously we will uh, we'll be reaching out very carefully through Joe and Cheryl Sileski to the West and Westport Health District. I want to stress that the fall 2020 task force is the tip of the iceberg here. Um, I did add in today uh, guidelines for the task force. These are exact same guidelines that the school start end time task force work with, that it's an advisory body to the superintendent. It will be making recommendations through the superintendent to the board for any major decisions. Along the way, though, given this idea of at the tip of the iceberg, for example, Wednesday, the 
Curriculum Council is going to be busy at work on a number of the items here. Principals will be busy at work, um, as I'll update you in a second. Uh, we already, for the task force meeting Friday, uh, have some work done, and that'll be handed out to the principals. So the task force almost will be the common meeting place for people to hear about work, suggest more work, and then we'll be reporting out very actively every after every task force meeting. And if that's weekly, that's a lot. We'll be reporting out to the community here are highlights of this discussion. Here's work we're doing. And we'll also through the board committee processes, the monthly meeting, but also every week be kicking out at least a short, quick hit. Here's what the task force is working on. Um, so I want to stress that we listened in the matter of days to broadening the task force. Again, I think it's broadly representative and also then underscoring just the nature of how this task force will do its work. What's critical for this task force is a now very large planning framework. Other districts are asking this, asking me for this. So it's getting shared across Fairfield County with other superintendents. I borrowed from them. They're now asking for information back. Um, and in there are the guidelines, the task force membership, very importantly, how we're gonna communicate. The consultation network, I wanna underscore how important that is because witness what you heard from the principals. It's a new era. Uh, there is authorities above the Board of Ed. There are authorities above the superintendent and that's for public health purposes. There may be things we wanna do and at least I appreciate you sharing what you know seniors are saying to you, but we are now, and we have to do it with compassion and care, but we're having to say there are public health reasons we have to do certain things. We close fast for public health reasons. We will open slowly for public health reasons. At such an obvious point, we're often forgetting it because we're in such a mind boggling time, uh, something many of us never would have ever anticipated. What's important in the document are three reopening scenarios, three reopening scenarios. One is the normal model, that we're fortunate enough to come back just as we always come back in the fall. The second is the hybrid model. That's somewhere on a continuum of, we're back here on campus through full distance learning and the hybrid, you know what hybrid means, it'd be some blend across that continuum of we're here full on or we're distance learning full on. Within the hybrid model, distance learning, you heard earlier from Ken, Everybody is thinking about how we do this better. And Taffy, you talked about sharing emails. No need to apologize, because we get them directly. We get the calls directly, we get the emails directly. Uh, I don't tend to share those out to the board because we want to protect the privacy of the families reaching out, but Weston is wonderful at sharing their points of view. Uh, I got to thank the families for so many thank yous. Uh, they have been very quick to offer uh, the bouquets which we appreciate because they know how hard the work is, but people are telling us you're doing great, but you can do better. Sorry, Mike, and you can do better. That's the DBT. We're doing great and we can do better. So distance learning the hybrid model, we're already, as you heard, the curriculum council, the SILs, others are saying, how can we do distance learning better? Because if distance learning is part of the hybrid, which by definition it is, we can do that better. The third model is that we open the fall as we close the school year in full on distance learning. And if that's where we are, we need to be ready for that. And I don't know where we're gonna land on these three models. Remember, board, those listening, this is a recorded meeting, so let's go back and look at it. A larger authority, public health, our safety will determine largely how we open. So we're, but we're planning now certainly for hybrid and very intensively for the distance learning. In terms of where we are, Friday the task force will get from Mike Rizzo, Joe Michelli, and Cheryl Zukeski our hunch. And the community's heard me use that word before, hunch. It's our guess at what the public health requirements will be. Now, we cannot get ahead ultimately for decision making. We can't get ahead of the EOC. We can't get ahead of the Western Westport Health District. We can't get ahead of the CDC, the governor, but we can have some good hunches on what's gonna be required. So that's a list that Friday the task force will look at, and then it's gonna go right out to the principals to say, as busy as you are right now, let's begin working on how might your school meet 
some of those public health requirements. And I'm going to ask Mike in a second just to quickly summarize those so you see how tangible we're getting. So that's an example of planning for one aspect of the hybrid. You've heard a lot tonight about planning for the distance learning part of the hybrid. That public health piece that Mike's going to speak to is how are we safely back on campus, if I'm being clear. That's very tangible on the hybrid side of, of on campus. The distance learning side, Ken's talked to about how we're beginning to think about it this summer. Professional learning this summer for staff. The, the, the lesson packets, but then what might get done differently. Uh, and then distance learning model be full on with trying to understand that. But I don't know if Mike, if you just want to kind of give some highlights from that very tangible list, I think that'll help people think about, we're trying to move fast on thinking through the issues we have got to consider that we'll have to take time to consider. Absolutely. So I think um, we're trying to basically go as far as we can in our planning without getting ahead, like you said, Bill, of, of you know, the, the higher authorities that will make, you know, help help us make these decisions. <clears throat> um, so looking at, um, for example, PPE, making sure that we have ordered it, what is it going to look like? How much are we ordering? Um, who gets what? How do we distribute it is, is a consideration. I mean, I think regardless, of, you know, we can work on that now, you know, under the assumption that we're going to have to be considering that. Um, look, doing some planning in terms of ratios within the school setting, we know that we are going to, I mean, again, we're, we're a, a good hunch is that we're going to have to look at maintaining smaller ratios. How does that affect our staff and our deployment of our staff, training staff and students, uh, making sure that we can assure social distancing, mask usage, those kinds of things. How does this affect our building space, our transportation? Um, how do we look at social distancing in large group settings within the schools? For example, cafeterias, recess, transportation again, hallways, and into the classrooms, um, and then some things around general general well-being in terms of water, hand sanitizer, ventilation, and cleaning schedules. So, again, as Bill said, we, we can't get ahead of these decisions, but um, working with Joe, Michelli, and with Cheryl, we think that starting looking at some of these items here is, is you know, they're, they're going to be on our list. We can get as far as we can before we get, you know, the big decision about how it's going to look, but we're going to need to address them one way or another. Well, I have two other major points and want to really open it up for discussion. And you have, you know, the officers of the board are, are on the task force. Um, and so they might have some reflections, but two, two big points. Again, you had the short memo out community. Tonight you have the 28, 27, 29 page framework. There are three criteria that are really, really important here. There were four. I borrowed those from Kevin Smith, Superintendent Wilton. Again, the superintendent work is very tight, very close to the coaching of Melissa and others on the task force, whittled that down to three. That first criteria is really what Mike's speaking to, the public health criteria. We have to be able to open assuring us of student and staff health and well-being. So that that's the criteria that we're the, the, the specifics that Mike's speaking to is rounding out that criteria. Second criteria is what's the effect on student learning in a couple ways. And I wanna, I wanna put out a new sub question, if not big question, is as we understand that move to be on campus in a hybrid mode, we need to be understanding is that may be a drag on student learning as opposed to full on distance learning. Meaning the time spent to get half a population on the campus, have teachers working with half a population, does that distract them then from more robust work with the full population in a distance learning mode? Is it a bit parallel to some of the business sector we know where they're saying, instead of getting on a train to come to Manhattan now, we're getting office space near you in Connecticut? I eat some of the travel time, things like that. Because if you have staff traveling to get on campus for part of a day, you know that's taking away their time to be doing work with students where they may be focused distance learning. But at least that's the kind of question we need to be thinking through. The fall's coming as fast. We need to be thinking through that. Economic hardships, the third criteria, which may relate to the point I just made, not true for all families, but some of our families Supporting younger learners at home is making it really hard to do your job well. We know that. We know that. 
And so we have to be balancing that into this balance of it, whether we're hybrid with some time on, on campus or distance learning, or with distance learning, how much more support do we provide real time? So particularly the parents of younger children can step away from their child a bit more if they're having to keep their job moving, if I'm being clear. So we have to pay attention to the economic. Last thing, and trust me, I'm not going through it, is the bulk of this document is, an out, is laying out six major sets of everything we got to consider. I call it a checklist. Are we paying attention? And it's massive, but we've got to make sure we're paying attention to all those items. And that's in the framework page seven onward. It's organized into six major themes. So let me stop here. Intentionally a significant presentation. It's all documented in the material. And this is a living, moving process. And again, we close fast. We're going to open slowly. And we're going to open with assurances of health and with the uh, sign off of larger authorities that they are confident that our public health, our individual health will be protected and maintained. Um, Bill, uh, you know, um, you, you went through a lot there and, um, um, and I think that from a task force perspective, we've, uh, I think the framework we're operating on is, is a good one. Um, I do think that we really need to pursue those two avenues, which is one is distance learning, if that's the way we're going to basically be delivering our, uh, our curriculum in the fall. And also probably the most complex alternative is going to be the hybrid. And I think what's really important every step of the way that we're prepared to do one or the other. Um, as the public health directive becomes more clear, it'll inform us as to which one of these is going to be the overriding factor for how we actually uh, enter the fall. Um, and it's really important because right now, we really don't have one particular direction we're heading down. So it's very important to make sure that we communicate with everyone, um, especially in these early times when there really isn't a clear answer yet without a real strong public, uh, relation, uh, public health directive that uh, staff, families, everyone really understands every step of the way where we're at. Uh, and I think in this time where things are still a little confusing, communication with everyone is really critical. Any questions, comments from other board members? Bill, how often do you think you'll be updating not just the board, but the public on changes? I mean, I, I see them come through, um, you know, trickle through as you get news, you send it along. Do you plan on kind of making any sort of sweeping decisions by a certain deadline? or the task force, or is it really kind of a, we wait and see? And I see Tony's head shaking, which means yeah. wait and see. <laughs> yeah, it's a wait and see, um, but I, yeah, I, got, I, I have white hair. I've been in this business a long time. So I've worked with a lot of districts and, and whether in them or supporting them through my foundation days, educators love to say, I got the summer, I'll do it in the summer. I got the summer. I'll do it in the summer. And the summer, uh -huh. the summer is about two weeks long. Uh, yeah. When you feel it all back, the summer is about two weeks long. So the chair and vice chair began to hear my urgency today. I got some good coaching, not to scare people. But while we need to wait for higher authorities, that's why it's so impressive that Rizzo and Michelli and Cheryl, to be polite to Cheryl, uh, have already done their hunch list. So by Friday, they can hand that to the principals to say, on the hybrid side of this, as busy as you are, we got to get working on, can we make this hybrid piece work? And begin to attach, you know, some dollars and other things to it. Because, and I'm, I'm now reaching out to my fellow superintendents to say, in this lack of guidance from the state, in this lack of guidance from the state, 
given we don't have a lot of planning time, are you doubling down on the distance learning? Are you doubling down that we actually will be back? Because here's what I hope. If we're back with full on distance learning, we have done it really well and we got to do it better. And if we don't have a lot of time to plan, I want people to focus correctly. So it's, it's music to my ears that this great group of principals already has their teachers saying, what more can you do with distance learning? Right, right. Have some of that no matter what. But I, I'm going on a little bit long because I wish I could say, Taffy, by this date, we will know. No, um, I, I don't think you can. I, don't, but I, I, I asked the question sort of incorrectly. I mean, the question really is, is anything forcing you, forcing you to have to make some decisions or, you know, in other words, is there anything you're being pushed towards in terms of deadlines? That's a better way of asking it. My, my, my concern is that we, we will open in the fall in some form and we have only so many weeks left before we open in the fall. And I want to make sure we're maximized and people need a break. They need time off. So with that, do the math. What's left? I just I, I want us to be enough lead time to, to have, you know planned well for whatever is in the fall. So it may be within a couple of weeks we may be needing to, if you will, work on a hunch. That the hunch is it might be hybrid to this extent, or it may be more of the distance learning. But that's where I would be saying to staff keep going back in your your tool chest your skill set with distance learning because i don't think we're opening up full and normal i, I think, that's I think right. it's some amount of distance learning we'll figure as administrators with we'll figure out whether that hybrid side can work you know and and when you see mike's list it'll be clear what i mean by that it's that distance learning side that just people should start working as when it needed no matter what I think that's right. I, and I'm sure the task force is probably in agreement, but I think you think of it in terms of a split screen and the screen you're operating from is the one you know and the one you're diving into and proceeding. And meanwhile, over here on the other screen, you are making a plan for what if or what what could be, right? So it sounds like you've got those two tracks and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it you know emo, you know as you go down the road and into the summer probably emotions are going to run high in terms of people wanting to know one thing or another. I think we just have to stay very methodical in how we're approaching this in terms of uh, understanding what it means to have uh, a hybrid approach, if we can actually do it at all, what it means to have distance learning, and just be you know be to, be as prepared as we can. And at some point, there'll be a point of no return where the decision will will probably be made for us based on public health. The only other consideration, calendar-wise, and this might put some relief in the in the energy bank of the principals anyway, is we got to get through June twelfth. We got to get through June twelfth, and then people need to take a little bit of a breather. So. And, and we're a leaner team in the central office. And I mean, immediately we are, you know, so we're, we, we, we got to keep this moving, but we, we got to end this year with grace and style. And I want people focused on that while we are still beginning to work on, on the fall, you know, if that's helpful. Right. Hi, this is Victor. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, um, I had maybe a couple questions and, and, and maybe a couple comments as well. Is, um, I mean, first of all, I, I don't envy this decision. I mean, it's it's incredibly daunting and, and complex and, and to bring balance to this is extremely difficult. But um, is, there, is there a scenario where we think we're gonna get more pres prescriptive guidance and then it ends up being that we that it's it's really more open ended, and, and maybe that's an unfair question. But what kind of strict guidance are we expected to get? Well, I, I mean, Victor, that's I mean, on the call with a uh, hundred plus superintendents Friday, the commissioner, that was the question. You know, we need guidance, and 
We want to do what's best for each of our communities, but we want to be so different that X town is then in a problem with Y town as to why are you doing it that way? Um, so it's, it's really hard to say. I, I, I'm not sure I'm giving you a helpful answer um, that, again, public health decisions are going to drive this. And I, I think you just look at today. I'm not tracking when beauty salons are opening, but I was advised late afternoon that while the governor was going to open them, he's now saying, no, we're not opening for a bit. And maybe someone will tell me I got the wrong news. Don't worry, I'm not going to a beauty salon. Maybe I shouldn't I need to. Um, actually, I do. But, um, but I mean, this is, it, it's an example of the shifts, you know? Uh, and uh, so we, we've got a plan. And I think Friday, when you see the kind of specific list that, that you know, Mike's put together with Cheryl and Joe. That gives you a list of all these things we got to figure out. But at some point, the larger authorities may say we can't guarantee safe opening. We also have the vast majority of our employees working for a, a, a union, and the union's going to stand up to protect their members, and we should respect that and honor that. Uh, and the CEA statewide may take a stand at some point. They might say if we can't have guaranteed testing for everybody walking into a building, we're not, we don't think it's safe for our, our members to go in. I don't know if that would happen, but that, that could be significant, obviously. So these are all those unknowns. Uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm not sure I'm being helpful. Yeah, no, no, it is. It's very helpful. And the, the, the two other things that, that are just um, ruminating with is that, um, you know, we, we talk about, about well-being of this of the students, right? And I just I hear you know the ESS presentation and the comments by the principals, and and just the you know how we define well-being has to have that social emotional component as well, right? So I you know it's not a question, and it's 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 just it's just part of the conundrum. But I, I struggle internally on on making sure that that. Um, Again, it's the, striking that balance in this decision is almost impossible. Uh, but but you hear you hear about when we say health, uh, I just can't can't uh, stop at thinking about the other side of of the implications of um, of isolation and the, and the impact on social emotional as well. So um, not a question, not a, not that I think you can do anything differently about it, but I think that that perspective of health. I, I hope that it's a it's a balanced discussion on 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 social emotional as well as um, physical. Yeah, and I it's 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 a great statement. Let me underscore where this town this town has built a staff and built an orientation and built a culture in these schools. I walked in and found it. This ain't about me, but they have built the resources to worry about what you're saying, Victor. And even for the reductions we've made, that core is here very strongly and powerfully. So you still have teachers you can teach and yes, woven in the DBT, woven in the emotional intelligence. We also have in every building, counselors, social workers, um, school psychologists, reach with ESS. So, I mean, we are positioned as better than almost any district to provide that support. And that's why we, we, we have to maintain that. We have to keep that going uh, because I, I'm a dad. I'm a dad and, and I got to reflect on that. My son's home from Bates. Is he going to go back in the fall? I don't know. My oldest son is doing virtual coaching. What, what's going to happen there? I got a kindergartner who misses her teacher every day. I see it every morning, every morning, you know? So when we hit the fall, here's my point. I'm going to be selfish for, for my four children. They're going to be looking at a fall like, oh, my goodness. So we got to be right there. I build out from that emotionally in my role here. How are we? We are exactly right. Victor. And and so we got to be focused on that social emotional just as much as the academic. I, I, because this fall, it is going to be a set of very potentially, potentially difficult moments. And we got to be right there to support it, as many people as we can. Mm hmm. And and the the last point I'll make and 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 again it's I, I can't I know there's probably not a good answer for it but uh, we do have four different schools with four different profiles you know as part of this task force 
Um, to the extent I would just urge people to have the breath of thinking that there may be more than one solution per school, right? So that's I just leave you with that thought. Yeah, Victor, uh, this is Tony. I, I think that last thought, you know, we, we've talked about that in the task force. While there's overarching issues that are uh, that are um, that are just that overarching issues, the implementation on every school is maybe slightly different simply because of the fact that, you know, uh, each school is different in what they need to deliver. So I, I agree. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, that ultimately we're going into buildings, right? Um, and we have four buildings. Any other questions or comments? Sounds like there's no others. Yeah. I just no. wanted to say, yeah, that, um, I mean, I feel a little bit like, you know, everybody's in denial because <laughs> we don't have all that much time. So I just want to make sure that in your planning, you're like sort of giving yourself a cost benefit rough idea and not spending a ton of time working on anything that, you know, at the end of the day, you really could be planning a really robust um, digital learning platform that, you know, sorry, but it's probably going to be the reality. So I, I, I'm just wondering, like, at what point are you going to go down a road and say, okay, this just isn't worth it? No, Hillary, very good question. Um, I, I think the importance for all of you to know is that, that a, a basic hunch on the public health guidelines, we've crafted that. It's a hunch. And then as of Friday, you know, we're going to look at that in the task force. I think it makes sense to share that out, the kind of issues we're considering, share that with the principals and support them in sort of thinking through quickly how much of those basic things, what's it going to take to address those? And if it starts to be a pile up on what's realistic, you then, my, my bias is I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, but I, I want to be cautious here because um, someone very thoughtful today said to me, hey, Bill, if you just say it's only distance learning, that's all it is, you're really, people are going to get sad. They're going to get upset. But it may not be that. We may be able to get a blend. So we're trying to think that through. Um, and, and, but again, be really efficient here and very thoughtful. Um, and that's why I think it's, it's, I mean, distance learning will probably be some part of this. So it's good people are working on that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also like, at what point, at what day are you going to make this call? You know, I don't, I, I you're waiting for what? <laughs> well, this is where, I, I mean, it's a, it's a highly scientific phrase, mind boggling. You know, I, 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 we're, we're working on it, but we can't make a decision that puts us in a place outside of where the public health authorities would be. Um, you know, it, it, unless we were to say, we're just gonna do pure distance learning, but if other districts find by waiting a bit longer, you're able to open partially to bring students onto campus, that's not you know, necessarily gonna be satisfactory. So we're trying to you know, sort this, this out. I, there is not a date. Also, you have to remember that, do you think that there is a scenario where you have distance learning for a period of time and then all of a sudden you flip a switch and you're all back to school? I think that even if you extend distance learning, you're going to have to, I think the public health directive is going to constrain how, you know, the glide path of going back as well. I, I you know, you got to remember that it's, it's, it, it's it's not just one or the other. It may be one then phased into another, right? I you know we still don't know. Tony, that's a very very helpful point, and I think it goes to several of the questions here about how do we be highly efficient, not waste time, and get mu multiple assignments done for one task, right? right? So again, it's. You know, it's Monday. Friday, I said to Joe, 
Mike and Cheryl put that list together. They got it together today. Fine tuning it a bit. They'll have it to the task force Friday. It'll be out. That's again, the hybrid side of the equation. What's it going to take? We might find be it state directive or something else. We've got to more, go more on the distance learning, but here's my point, picking up on your point, several months down the road, once we're in school, we got to come back to that hybrid because we're going to, you know, we left fast. We're going to come back slowly, you know, whenever that's, you know, slowly hits, it, it, you know, so even if we're distance learning in the fall, there'll be another point where we're trying to phase in. So work done now will help for that. If I'm being. If there's no other questions or comments, let's, uh, let's move to the, uh, meeting dates for next year. Uh, hope, Tell me, I just, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Ruby. Go ahead. I was just going to say, going into the meeting dates, I just had, after reviewing it, I had one call out, um, and that pertains to the January meeting date. Um, so I looked last year, typically we receive the budget books right after the new year. Um, so in, in this, this path or this year, we, we received the budget books on the 6th and we did not vote, um, on the budget until the 27th. So that gave the board and team a good 21 days to review the budget where this year I'm going to. To, to assume that we'll get, again, same similar budget books on the 4th, which is the Monday after New Year's. And right now the January meeting is slated for the 19th. So that only gives the yeah. team 15 days or two yeah. weeks. To to, this, this is just your board meeting schedule. There's a separate budget schedule. You may remember during your January process, you had a just a regular monthly board meeting. That's what this is. Uh, we'll layer in the budget meetings later. And, and I know you're going to be re reflecting as a board on this year's budget process. And that I'm assuming would include your budget calendar. So th this is your standard monthly schedule. Not oh, okay. You know what? I'm sorry, Bill. I thought for some reason I assumed that we voted on the budget on the 27th, which was our January Board of Ed meeting. Yeah, it was a sep that was a separate okay. meeting solely for the budget. Yeah. Sorry, apologies. No, no, that's good. Good question. Um, if there's no comments or questions, we probably should have a motion on this. I'm assume everybody looked at these before. Can I have a motion? Move that the Western Board of Education approve the board meeting dates for 2020 2021. Uh, second. Gina, second. Thanks, Gina. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, Ruby. Aye, Melissa. Aye, Gina. Aye, Victor. Aye, Hillary. Aye, Tony. Uh, all opposed? No, motion passes. Uh, let's now go to the uh, financial update. Bill? How's everyone doing? All right. All right, good. No, you guys have been waiting for this moment, so here we go. <laughs> so before we jump into um, the, re the reports as of April, I just want to take the moment just to recap you know, some of the challenges that we had to overcome for this past fiscal year, which has definitely been a very challenging one. Um, just to highlight the main budget challenges we had, um, we had salary over budget items that we had to deal with for various um, various salaries. Also tied into that was, was uh, employee benefits, transportation, and legal fees. So in salaries, we were looking at a shortfall of roughly $141,000, benefits of 178,000, I'm sorry, 148,000 for salaries, benefits at 178,000, transportation overage of 271,000, and legal fees up on the last time I checked of roughly $126,000. 
for our overall deficit or unbudgeted items of $716,000. So that's just a quick recap of where we were and um, compared to where we are right now. Um, I guess the good news is that we were able to mitigate the vast majority, if not all of these line items, um, as you can tell by this report um, that we have for April. So for the period ending April 30th, 2020, we, we have spent roughly 76% of our current budget of 40, or $40,572,508. We have still have encumbered, um, net encumbered of, and anticipated roughly 22, 22.5% or 23%. Total on 11,949,929. And maybe for the first or second time this year since I've joined, I can say that we will have the surplus of 551,000 and 278, 551, 278, roughly 1%. And you guys have um, a quick recap of how we pretty much ended at this at this um, surplus, so to speak. And it's really two parts. Um, management decision was made because of all the, the deficits that we had pretty much to freeze the budget and we implemented a budget freeze in a rough mid-April or so and we closed that process out um, on April 24th. So the savings that we have just in a broad, that's on a gross level, we have overall an, an overall gross savings of $860,000 of that primarily $367,000 had to do with management decision or pretty much a budget freeze and just taking a hard look at where we were and things that we needed to do to get to where we were. The second part of that had to do with COVID-19 savings. At the initial pass that we did, we, we estimated that we will have savings for COVID of roughly $493,000. So there, there's a few offsets that we have to that $860,000 savings. Included in the 551 savings are line item deficits that we, we would need to cover for employee health insurance of $140,000. We also need to cover a shortfall in um, funding for, for a capital, capital uh, project where we did not receive an anticipated grant of roughly $96,462. In addition to that, also related to COVID, our closure related to COVID is um, revenue offsets that we will not receive. Just to name a few of those items, we, had, we will not receive parking fees, uh, participation fees related to athletics, theater receipts. Um, we will not, we're gonna have limited um, reimbursement or limited facility rental revenue. And of course, tied in not to COVID, but as in general, um, our Medicaid reimbursement reduction of roughly $68,000. So in terms of our overall shortfalls relating to revenue loss, we're looking at $73,000 that we will not be able to, to earn, so to speak, for this year, which will lead to an ultimately net savings for the year at this pass of roughly $551,000. Any question on part one? Okay, moving on to budget transfers. For the month of April, we had transfers totaling $10,368.88. There was one in excess of $5,000, which would need board approval. Um, and that item has to do with a shortfall for an occupational therapist for PPS services of $7,750.47. Any, qu any questions? Okay. Move into the internal services one. Curious, Phil, what was that occupational therapist about? Just give me some detail on that. Um, Mike? Uh, the occupational therapist is uh, actually directly related to student services, so providing occupational therapy to students uh, who need that per their IEP. I mean, I know what an occupational therapist is oh. and what they do, but I was just wondering, um, it, was this a... Oh, it was a transfer. Oh, sorry. I thought it was a shortfall. And I was like, why would that? Okay, sorry. It's just a transfer. Forgive okay. me. That's fine. Carry on. Okay. Moving on to the Internal Services Fund. For the period ended April 30th to 2020, we've spent $346,145, which will, as of April, 
the current fund balance is one million one ninety one two hundred and twelve dollars. And okay. And that is it for the financial update for the period ended April thirtieth, twenty twenty. Um, you know, on the just a just a word on the uh, on the five hundred and fifty one thousand uh, that we have um, at the bottom line. Now that um, that at the end of the year is really going to go back to the back to the town. Now the question is, um, in how does it how did how did how did the mechanics work, right? Because next year we really anticipate having, especially you know if we're going back in any form, um, and even if we don't, we have. And anticipated costs that might require us to go, and probably will require us to go back to the town for a supplemental. Now the question is: Does that does that go back to the town general reserve, or do we create a a lapsing fund that's COVID related, where we tap into it for expenses related to reentry, uh, COVID related reentry? I think that's something that. The Board of Finance is currently deliberating. I think that other towns uh, have been reluctant to do it. Um, other down Board of Finances have been reluctant to do it. I think um, it's still on the drawing board for our Board of Finance to consider. But whether we have a special fund that's earmarked or not, um, we have certainly sent uh, the message loud and clear that there's a very high probability that will be coming uh, for more next year because we anticipate uh, significant costs uh, related to reentry if and when that occurs. If there's no questions, thank you guys very much. You have a motion? Move that the Western Board of Education approve the 10th fiscal year 2020 financial update. Uh, second. Second, Kathy. All in favor? Aye, Ruby. Aye, Jean. I'm, I'm Melissa. Aye, Victor. Hi, Hillary. Guys are slowing down. <laughs> yeah, for a moment there, I got a little bit nervous. Like, like hour five here. Uh, I, Tony, is that it? Yep. Uh, all opposed? Motion passes. Uh, final, final topic. Bill, do you want to start on this? Sure. Um, did you say Bill or Phil? Uh, Bill or Phil. But. All right, I'll, I'll start and then maybe Phil and then maybe Tony comes yeah. in. Obviously, we've been working a lot with the Board of Finance and the Board of Finance is doing all it can, it can to optimize the, the resources for the town, the district in this very, very difficult, unclear financial situation. It's, it's my understanding the Board of Finance is looking for additional reductions beyond what we've already, as you as a board, have, have provided. Um, they are highly, as you know, respectful and appreciative of the very strong leadership you provided on the budget, getting it down to roughly 228, 229 in terms of growth uh, year to year. That's the lowest in most of the years. Also, you know, the kinds of reductions that have been made um, have been largely through administration and administrative services. Uh, you know, not into the classroom or into the academic program or the social emotional learning program, which I want to keep an eye on. Uh, can everyone put their phone on, on mute if they're not speaking? Okay. Thanks. Um, you know, but we have before us, uh, you know, the need for some additional reductions. Typical pattern at this point in the cycle, as many of you know, is uh, a board awaits the decision by the Board of Finance. And then, because all your work on budgets is done in public, 
then with that assignment, if you will, that additional reduction from the Board of Finance, you go to work on what those reductions might be. Um, obviously, we're doing some thinking in terms of the administration on what's possible. Uh, my recommendation right now would be that the administration keeps working on potential reductions. We hear where the Board of Finance is Thursday night. Uh, they're voting on June 1st. Once we know that decision, then we, uh, we would bring to you a set of reductions that uh, fit within what the Board of Finance has established as a budget. And then in full public process, you would work through, are those the types of reductions that you agree to? Um, I don't know, Tony, if you want to add to that. I think that's what Phil and I had planned to share. Phil, you, did I cover it? Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I think there's, you know, um, right now the framework, the Board of Finance is really uh, right now, um, I think their mind seems to be, and we'll hear on Thursday, seems to be to try to end up with a flat mill rate. Um, I think that's that's where uh, that's where the discussions uh, over the last several days seem to be heading. Uh, and in order to achieve that, uh, they basically want to tap into three items. One is the operating budget, uh, both town and, and education, the uh, capital budget, and the uh, reserves. And so now it's figuring out exactly how to allocate what it takes to get a, to a, a zero to a flat mill rate um, by basically doing something that um, seems to be kind of rough justice in terms of allocating it to the three categories. Um, and so I anticipate there'll be some more coming our way. I really don't know how much more. Um, but uh, I think on Thursday, we'll probably learn a lot more of what's going on. But that seems to be where things are going right now. And so, um, you know, I think just given the, um, the places in which we need to make some of those adjustments, it's probably better to wait and see where everything ends up and then um, go to the, you know, come to the board with, um, you know, one last time with, for a final set of adjustments. Any questions? No? Okay. Move to uh, superintendent's report. Anything, Bill? Uh, well, I'm giving you all a virtual pot of coffee um or tea um or a virtual run around the lap uh and i did walk the campus today and and i did see a lot of our people out taking advantage and i didn't bring out my yardstick but i know that my arm reaches seven feet so i think that all were out there taking advantage of things being reopened and largely staying at least uh an arm's length mine away from each other. I didn't go out and measure them because that would have violated social distancing. But I'm, I'm trying to br bring uh, some lightness to a really challenging phase. But it was, it was heartening to see the campus looking great and people coming back onto campus to use it in very safe and sound ways. And we, we hope we can let that continue. That is my superintendent's report. Great. Any uh, Anything from the committee chairs? No. Um, I just want to highlight from the communication committee, um, just a huge thank you to Craig. He has done um, just a lot of work with launching our new website. Um, Not he launched, has, yeah, hasn't launched yet, but yeah. No, he hasn't launched yet. Yes. The soft launch is on June 22nd. We will work through kind of a live maintenance, if you will, pressure tests where we can, and then kind of the formal launch will be at the beginning of, um, of August. But he has just done a, a, a tremendous amount of work on partnering with people, understanding who's owning what, um, getting everyone with, in sync with that, um, having weekly communications with all of those partners, coupled with creating a wonderful kind of live document on how to. Um, and so just 
big thank you to Craig and, and I hope everyone looks forward to seeing our new website. Great. Yeah. Um, on the, on the facility side, just the town facility committee, you know, update, you know, I think you'll, you'll be hearing a bunch of stuff that the town facilities committee is looking at, but what, what they really are doing is really understanding right now, the phase one and phase two work, right? So, um, and so really everything that's going on is to bring everybody up to speed on that. Um, so they had uh, Mike Zuba from Malone and McBroom come um, several weeks ago to talk about the the um, uh, the enrollment uh, work that they do. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Silva Petricelli will be there to talk about the work they did in phase one and phase two. Um, so I think my view is it's 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 a lot of learning right now. Um, and I don't expect uh, anything new to come out of this for uh, for a little while, given uh, how much learning everyone needs to do and understanding numbers and so forth. So, so there's really nothing new to report. So I don't want to really belabor the point, except everyone's just learning right now. Um, if that's it for everyone let's um this is this is probably not a record but probably close to a record and everyone's still hanging in there and smiling that's good. um next month it'll probably be longer but great <laughs> yeah I... but uh but um but we went through a lot of material tonight so mm -hmm. can i have a motion to adjourn so moved okay um second Second. Thank okay. you. All right. Meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank Bye. you. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.